Madam Vice President, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> my fellow Americans, welcome to The Daily Wire backstage. I am Jeremy Boring. I'm joined by Candace Owens. Ben Shapiro. <laughs> Andrew Clavin. Mm -hmm. Matt Walsh. <laughs> and Michael Knowles. Mm. At the end of this, this is going to be basically what you're getting from us all night tonight. This is the kind of wit one can expect when we're forced to stay at work late and watch a boring ass one hour and a half speech. If you want to hang out with us after that, and honestly, I can't imagine what would motivate such behavior, we will be doing a killer members block where we take questions from our Daily Wire Plus members. You can become one and get your question in there by going to dailywire.com slash subscribe to get 40% off. Why 40% off? Well, because 40% off may not be enough to buy the president, but it's enough to influence the culture. That's right. It's our president is for sale sale <laughs> at Daily Wire Plus, <laughs> Daily Wire Plus <laughs> slash subscribe. Guys, the last time we were all together, uh, of course, it was election night, and uh, it, it was disappointing, not as disappointing as having to watch the State of the Union, of course. Uh, and Stephen Crowder was with us, <laughs> which just goes to show that Things happen really fast in our business. <laughs> <laughs> Again, not State of the Union speeches. No, they, no. They're interminable. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Grammys had not come out as openly satanic. It's yeah. true. It's true. Sponsored, um, sponsored by Pfizer. <laughs> so that, so on the nose. I'm telling you, God is just, his writing is, it's really degraded over the past few <laughs> years. But I, I do God's wanna... writing is so on the nose. He's casting like weird German Nazi-esque characters as the head of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, he, and he's got, uh. like, and, and he's got, the president's son being like a drug addicted derelict who's taking money from from the Chinese, probably, mm -hmm. and dad leaving classified documents next to the Corvette. And they already used that storyline already. And like th this is just this is lazy, lazy writing. Chinese spy balloons. And now the Grammys <laughs> going going totally satanic. I, I will say about the, the Grammys going satanic that I, I, I think it does say something a little bit deeper about our culture that Jill Biden was there. Right. Like the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the it used to, there was a time when satanic imagery was at least fringe, right? It was the counterculture and it was rebelling against the culture. And now it's just the culture. It's what we just call the culture. And the reason for that, here we're going to get into your, John Milton's Satan is the villain of the piece in Paradise Lost, right? His whole thing is that he's rebelling against God, not because he's doing anything good or anything noble or anything true or beautiful, but because he would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. And over the course of time, I think Western culture now sees Satan as the hero. And Satan is the hero because Satan is narcissistic and into himself. And that's exactly what you saw at the Grammys. A bunch of people who are narcissistically prancing around calling themselves non-binary, gender, queer, transgender people. Who was it you said was there? Jill, Jill Biden. Biden. Dr. Jill. Doctor. Oh, great. doctor. The, sur the surgeon. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Jill yeah. Biden. Yeah. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah. I, I always mess that up. I always mess that up. It's, that's what, it's so that's frustrating because people... my life's a real doctor. <laughs> anyway. That's what Wait, people don't understand we, when we talk about how the left is satanic or a lot of pop music is satanic. And most of it is satanic, but it's not theologically satanic. Right. Like, they're not literally worshiping the devil as far as they understand it. They're worshiping what the devil worship, which is the self. So it's, it's kind of like a, a secular Satanism. At the same time, I think we should also recognize that there's this, you know, the left likes to use the term gaslighting, which is all they do with things like this, because part of the reason that they do it is that they, they can have the satanic ritual being broadcast by CBS, and then conservatives react to it by saying, hey, look, there's a, there's a satanic ritual on TV. And then the next day, you get the uh, the headlines from like the Daily Beast and all those saying, "Well, conservatives with their conspiracy theory that there was a satanic ritual in the Grammys." It's like, but it's, it's what literally happened. We're just observing. But it's it's not it's a, not a, a face tattoo it's syndrome, right? It's like when you go into the the Starbucks and the barista has a giant face tattoo, and you're like giving him weird looks. He's got a face tattoo, and then he's like, "What are you staring at? It's like, your face tattoo." That's what I'm staring. <laughs> but it brings up the point of that Jill Biden was there, that they are now the culture, and we are the counterculture. We should stop reacting to them and just let them react to us because they do. But, but they baited right. us if intentionally. Got, but if they had gotten up, if we had gotten up and sung "Jesus Loves Me," this I know, they'd have gone insane. <laughs> yeah. And we should we should do it that way. I mean, I would have gone and, insane and, too. And, that song is terrible. And, <laughs> I would have terrible. I, I would have had the, problems. <laughs> but, the, but the one thing is, though, when you say that they Jesus they don't worship me. Satan per se, they actually do worship 
they actually do worship something satanic. I mean, there are only two ways to look at life. One is that your body is your real you, you know, uh, and your lust and your desire is your real you. And the other is that your lust and desire are in the way of something even higher, that they, you know, they're part of your life, but there's something even higher that you're striving for. And what they're saying is, no, they're not. And unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, that's what rock and roll has been saying <laughs> since yep. it started. You know, so it's only coming to fruition. And it's coming to fruition in the dullest. That's, that number was so boring and mm-hmm. so anodyne. Well, do you know what's so and, sad about it? With, with Sam Smith in particular, Sam Smith is actually, I think, a, a talented oh, pop yeah. musician. Incredibly He's got talented. the voice of an angel, now the voice of a demon. And, and, <laughs> and, and his songs are, are pretty good. And what was amazing is his biggest hit, the, the one that I knew him from, was I know I'm not the only one. You know, you say I'm crazy, but you don't think I know what you've done. And it's it's about this marriage where the the husband goes out and cheats, and it's falling apart, and it's presented as this terrible tragedy. You like that song? I, I do actually like that song. I think there's I a lot of things about. I, uh, no, I, listen, I'm I'm a pop culture maven, you know. But but it's it's sung beautifully. It's got a, a lot of longing and tragedy to it. This song was about the exact same topic. In fact, the, the, it followed the exact same formula right down to the seconds of the time codes. The difference is this was about how funny and hot and titillating it is when, you know, daddy goes to the body shop and gets hoochie hoochie or whatever. Right. And, and so it's so sad because he had a, an instinct toward beauty. Then he sells his soul to the devil and it didn't even work. It was a crappy song, and the ratings were in the gutter. Michael, I really hate to tell you Santa's not real here, but all of his prior music, which I absolutely adore, I, I love the Catholic reimagining of it. <laughs> it was not about a marriage between a man and a woman. He was, it was about these gay affairs. No, wait, he's a gay guy? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes, but it was music about love and about loss, and his his music was so beautiful. And what's really happened, because I, I question this myself, it's you were so talented, you had everything, you made it, people were listening to your music. Why did you have to give yourself to... This sort of demonic nature that we're seeing inside of him. What happens when you get to Hollywood that they basically say, okay, now you just have to do a demonic ritual to prove that you're really one of us? The most bizarre part of the entire performance is a standing ovation at the end, by the way. Oh, yeah. You can see a couple of faces, I think, like J-Lo and Ben Affleck, where maybe for a second, like, should we be clapping to this or are we actually at a satanic ritual? But they got a standing ovation. Like, no one in the room went, okay, this might be a little far. And they keep moving the goalposts. By the way, this is not the first time that they went full satanic at the Grammys. WAP, can we forget the WAP performance? Oh, yeah. she was I cannot. Wholesome. No, you you <laughs> I cannot. cannot. I, I will never be as allowed an, to. You will not, as no. You no. will not be allowed to. Is an expert on all matters WAP. <laughs> and, and, you know, this, it's been going, this treading in this direction cover. for a very long time. I think this time is the first time that they just were so in your face. First, it's a conspiracy theory. The left, you know, we always say it's satanic, it's demonic, Hollywood's evil. And then they, they go, oh, no, we're not, no, we're not. And then they do this. And, and, and they acknowledged it, too. You saw CBS tweeted out, they said, in response to Sam Smith, mm-hmm. said, we are ready to worship. And it made me think, 1952, CBS would not allow I Love Lucy to use the word pregnant. So scandalous was yeah. that word. Now, CBS News is essentially saying, hail Satan. And it cannot, it, you can't convince me that it's an accident that that was going into the break sponsored by Pfizer. Of course it was intentional. Of course it was intentional. It was. Because, no, because, look, we're a conservative media company. We sit around thinking, okay, how do we own the libs today, right? I mean, that's yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. things we think about. To drink their delicious tears. Because it's so tasty and it fills the tumblers. Uh, <laughs> they, they think the same way. They're a news network. That's and right. if you think that it was an accident, it was a mere coincidence that Pfizer was the commercial right as the devil is walking off stage, I got a bridge. I do, you know, there's, there's something, there's something what you were point, saying. One high point, though, was that Ben Affleck's face, since you mentioned Ben Affleck, yeah. he did, it did reflect how I feel about having to listen to the State of the Union. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point out that Matt Walsh's... Uh, Laryngitis voice is the sexiest voice on the panel tonight. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, Matt, I think you should read the first ad. Yeah, well, <laughs> speaking of Satanists, that's probably not the right uh, intro. To in the, oh, we did, we did sorry, ExpressVPN. <laughs> Let's go with it. In the not too distant past, private citizens used to be largely that private. What's changed? The internet. Think about everything you've ever searched for, watched. Tweeted on the internet. Now imagine all of that data being crawled, collected, and sold off to advertisers. That's what happens every time you go online with ExpressVPN. There are hundreds of data brokers out there whose sole business involves buying and selling your data. But ExpressVPN reroutes your connection through an encrypted server that makes it more difficult for third parties to find you. All you have to do is download the app on whatever device you're using and tap one button. If you, like me, believe that your data is your business, secure yourself with DailyWire's most trusted privacy partner. Visit expressvpn.com backstage. They get three extra months free. That's EXPRSSVPN.com slash backstage, expressvpn.com slash backstage to learn more. One other thing, by the way, is the, uh, I think it's worth noting, 
that the guy that uh, was performing that song with Sam Smith, Kim Petras, right? Uh, and they they won. Uh, it was a, it was a big moment because it's two white males won best pop duo <laughs> because right. they both don't identify as white males. But Kim Petras transitioned surgically to become a female at the age of sixteen. Wow. And this is something we're told, of course, never happens. That's that's not, well, we don't do surgical transitions of minors. Uh, yet, like one of the biggest pop stars in the world right now, huh. that's literally what happened to him. So. You know, I, I think also wow. his his real name is Tim. And which is kind of clever to go from Tim to Kim. Yeah. And uh, he, he goes up and he, he says, look, uh, people say that this performance was religiously not cool. Because you might say it's uh, actually burning with the eternal fires of hell. But, you know, it's <laughs> not, not cool. And he says, but look, I've always been interested in religion. I want, but religion doesn't want me because I'm trans. Yeah. And I thought, you know, look, religion is a, a habit of virtue and justice to render to God what he's due. Relig- religion wants you. God wants you. Every, God loves you. God wants if you say that, well, the condition of my going to church or being religious is that you have to pretend that I'm a woman, you're demanding <laughs> that everybody affirm a lie. And that's something that religion cannot do. Oh, come so, on. Uh, shockingly, I know. So it's like, don't, you know. <laughs> you this ruin what, everything. These guys always do this, though. They say it's, it's God's fault. It's the, it's the church's fault. They don't yeah, want me. They don't a, want me. There, there's, a, there's a point to, to what Drew was saying earlier about how anodyne the actual, yeah. the actual number was. And it was. I mean, it was almost bizarrely sexless. Like, yeah. it, it's satanic, but there's nothing sexy about it no. or, or interesting, really. The same and with the WAP performance, by the way. It wasn't actually sexy. I right? tend to agree, obviously. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that happens is that when the taboo becomes the culture, there is no more forbidden for people to even be tempted by. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the things that you're seeing in our culture is that, that you know, by every available poll, married people have better sex lives than people who are single because what they're doing exists in the boundaries of love and also within the boundaries of commitment. But there's also something to the idea that the human being is constantly seeking the new and the, and the fresh or whatever it is. When, all, when nothing is new and nothing is fresh and you've made all the taboos just the mainstream culture, there's nothing left to transgress. So when Madonna was doing the, you know, kind of virgin slut routine back in 1980, and that's, that's what they call it, it's not my term for it, that's sort of the cultural term for it, when she was doing the, the kind of taking advantage of the imagery of the Virgin Mary and then subjecting that yep. to, to, you know, very sexy movement, then the idea was that she was subverting expectation, but there was no expectation left for them to subvert. And so how exactly do you transgress? There's nothing... When there's nothing left to transgress, it becomes very difficult to be transgressive other than ideologically transgressive. Yeah, I, I'd like to add, I talked about this on my podcast because I was very interested in this. Like, why is he doing this? And I started talking about just the actual meaning of the word diabolical, and I played a Catholic priest. He there we very, go. All right. Very proud of that. Um, obviously, first no, obviously about I can The actual all of you. meaning of the word diabolical, where it comes from, and it, what it means is to separate, <laughs> and what they're actually aspiring to do. You go, why put on this diabolical performance? And really, when you know the serpent comes up to uh, Adam and Eve, and the, one of the first things that they recognize after they bite into the forbidden fruit is that they feel shame, right? Which mm-hmm. means in order for, for Satan to assert dominance, he needs to remove people from their shame. He needs to separate them from this, this wholesomeness and this goodness, right? And to say, there's actually nothing wrong with you being naked. Why do you even feel that? So you see that Hollywood is kind of pushing for people not to think that there's anything to be shameful for. And the you know, androgyny. There, there, was a story, there was a story this week that actually made me want to move away from Earth. You know how mm-hmm. sometimes you think I want to get out of the country, but this made me want to leave the planet. <laughs> was this... Girl on the newsroom. Yeah, yeah, really. For some, for some, <laughs> but there was there was this girl on YouTube who does a show. I think she's a gamer girl. Twitch she calls herself QT Cinderella Twitch. Mm. on Switch, right? Um, that's right. Switch the gamer channel, and uh, somebody made a, a a mock porn of her. They put her into mm-hmm. what's it called? Deep fake, yeah. a deep fake porn thing of her, and she was shattered. She went online, and it was absolutely heart rent. I mean, it was such a cruel low, stinking thing to do. And at the same time, she was sitting there going, you know, F the internet, F everything. F, F. And I thought, well, yeah, you know, like it's, it's not her fault that the culture fell apart, but it did, and she is part of it, and she's in it, and this is what people are doing to one another. Yeah. It was it was one of the most dis- disgusting acts, and conservatives were laughing at her yeah. for crying about it. And I just thought, like, you know, <laughs> it's like taxi. Could we go to Mars, right. please? Because I, I think that this is, you know, the... The results of worshiping Satan are not good. They're not yeah. fun. Their bodies stacked in, in rows. They're, they're, they're women being abused but, and people treating each other like garbage. But part of the reason, not to take this into the direction of talking about porn again, because I feel like that happens on every show now, <laughs> but, but the reason why, because I saw some of that too, conservatives were laughing at the, the girls who were in the deep fakes, and the reason they were laughing about it is because you know the, the conservative argument against porn has always been this kind of like, 
practical, well, porn feeds the sex trafficking industry and it's bad. It's like those kinds of arguments. And then you do AI or deep fake, and then the, now there's, those conservatives are out of arguments against porn because right. there's not any actual that's person a good, that's a great point, man. involved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, but what they lost is like, what does porn do to, like, what is it fundamentally? What does it do to the person consuming it? What does it do to the culture that allows it? Uh, we never had those arguments. And there's, well, there, you know, there's three kinds of beings. We're, we're just talking about demons, right? And, and some beings are purely body. They're corporeal beings. And some beings are pure spirit. That's angels and demons. And then we are hylomorphic. We're, we're both body and spirit. And the problem with porn is it just treats us like animals. It treats us like we're pure meat. And, and then when, when we see that, even people who have gotten accustomed to it in the culture, when you see that, when someone violates you and puts your head on a body yeah. or I don't know, whatever they did in the, the AI porn, yeah. you just think this is a violation not just of my body. It's a, obviously it's not of my body. Sure. It's a violation of my soul. This is, this is, I think, one of the broader points that ties back into to what happened with the Grammys and the reaction to it. It's why the libertarian instinct, which is, well, if you don't like it, just turn it off. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, the question is not whether people have the, the freedom to turn things on or turn things off. The question is, what does it do to the common pool of culture in which we all live when this sort of stuff is promulgated by the biggest institutions in our culture? We shouldn't be arguing over whether someone has the right to do it or not have the right to. That's actually a secondary question when the primary question is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Right, yeah. And people refuse to yeah. even have that argument. They're so, they're so consumed with this, the, the secondary question of whether what we ought to do about it mm -hmm. that they completely elide the first question, which is, as a society, can we agree that this stuff is just bad? Yeah. No, How about we, that? Well, no, we can't. <laughs> and this actually, this actually goes. I mean, obviously, they, the vice, the, the president of the United States' wife is there when it's well. The president of the United States is there. <laughs> the effective president, yeah, yeah, the de facto. That, but I, I, I want to say that there's another piece of this that that Candace you hit on, which is that it was actually boring, that it was sexless, that it's anodyne, that it's yeah. joyless. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, people love to call us grifters. And they like to call us grifters because sometimes we say things that our audience disagrees with, which I always think that's really funny. <laughs> like, so you mean that in order to be authentic, I'm willing to say things that might risk some of our money going away. That makes me a grifter. But the greatest grift of all is the purity grift. The, in, in politics, it's the political purity grift. And the political purity grift says, whatever, the, whatever moment we're in, you must be so truly that moment that you can always stab anyone on your own side who isn't perfectly, absolutely in line with this exact moment. But of course, you can't actually apply that yeah. across any period of time because human beings are messy, human circumstances are messy, politics changes. Like all the people who are right now political purists, you know, I, I, it's, if you don't support who, Donald Trump, you're, they all voted for Mitt Romney in 2012. Every one of them voted for Mitt Romney in 2012. And if you've reached a point of political purity where you're like, Paul Ryan is the scourge of the earth. Kanye may have had a point about the Jews, you know, like you've, <laughs> you've reached a point where you're, this political purity nonsense reveals itself as a grift. And in a way, what I think you're watching at the Grammys is just the left's version mm -hmm. of the political purity grift. Huh. Why, why does a guy who is so talented, who can put together such beautiful music, who can truly transcend politics, can transcend moments, can touch us all. We've all, with all of our diverse points of view, been just as enthralled with his music as anyone on the left has been enthralled. Why is he putting out something that means, that means not only nothing does, it means nothing to them, because it is a virtue signal. It is a way of appeasing the political purity grift on his side. And the political purity, the, the true grift in politics is to never authentically be what you are or say what you believe for fear that the dominant power right. of your tribe right. will will uh, reject you Hence for it. In their case, the devil. Hence the standing moment. ovation. I'm like, none of you thought this was weird. Because if you don't stand up, you're, you, you you're not pure. You the purity test. That's right. Yeah. And in, that's the whole point of liberty is we should all be disagreeing with each other. I mean, that's, that that's is right. the great thing about this place is we've all been fighting with each other since we, we started. But yeah. it, we, our conservatism consists of we're concer being concerned about liberty and the things that make liberty work. I mean, I don't, I don't only think that it's bad because people are going to do things that are bad if they're free. I think that there comes a point when it's actually threatening to the body politic of a free country to do certain things. And I think that, look, there's plenty of things that you can do in the privacy of your home that I might disapprove of that aren't going to pick my pocket or break my leg and aren't going to threaten the polity. But some of this stuff, when you have, when you have the establishment the, Jill Bi the Dr. Jill Bidens of the world, supporting this kind of garbage, which is not just artistically bad, but it's also morally bad. Mm. 
something has gone terribly wrong. By the way, lost, it, it you've is, lost the authority. You know, to well, say no. One of the things that we talk about all the time you know, now is is the distinction between adults and children, and we should allow adults to do things that children can't do. Obviously, that's true. Although I would say that there are certain things that adults should also With not be allowed. With plenty of limits, yeah. But yeah. it's a, but. One of the things that, that we ought to say here is that popular culture is designed for kids. Okay, the, to pretend that the Grammys is not directed at kids is a lie. To, to pretend that what was, that was put on the Grammys was designed for adults 18 and up, it's just not true. Okay, because if you ask a 12-year-old what exactly they are listening to, they're listening to exactly the same thing that a 15-year-old is listening to, which is exactly the same thing an 18-year-old is listening to, particularly when it comes to music. Music happens to be an area where those boundaries are unbelievably permeable. I'd say I watched and, the Grammys more as a child than I yeah, did yeah, that's that's right. And what's the busier. message that came out of that performance? I got dinged by our publicists over at Media Matters on this point, but it's a true <laughs> point, so I'll reiterate it. The, the, s- symbols have a purpose. We live in a semiotic world. World. Symbols are very, very important. That's the, what makes the world intelligible. <laughs> and and uh, what was the performance? At a, at a physical level, it was a bunch of transvestites. It w- uh, Sam Smith calls himself a pansexual or something. The other pro- main He's a non-binary, non-binary, non-binary pansexual. Natu- oh, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, want to be yeah, imprecise. Get that straight. Uh, no, good point. Don't get and, it straight. Don't get it and straight. And get straight. it very uh, <laughs> crooked, actually. <laughs> And the other one is a transgender, and then the rest were a bunch of drag queens. And you see this in a bunch of Sam Smith's videos, too. It was... A, a, a very pro-trans performance, as we see everywhere. And the symbol of that was the devil. And I couldn't help but notice, very often, artistic depictions of demons and weird occult stuff is androgynous and trans and weird. And I think the reason for this is... Wasn't that Little Nas X also? Didn't he? Little Nas X did the same right. thing. The reason for this is, that, or at least the traditional Christian understanding, is the devil hates human beings especially because we have flesh. And he doesn't want to bow down to some ape that has flesh on him. And that the, the fleshiness of this world is very offensive to demons that are pure spirit. And so, you know, the, the, our publicists knocked me for, for making this connection. I didn't make the connection. Sam Smith is the one putting on the performance. The fact that Little Nas X made the connection, the fact that this is the symbol they're all using, should tell us something about this real political problem. Transgen- mm. Transgenderism is really a mockery to creation itself. I mean, it's the it ultimate is. mockery yeah. to creation itself. But I gotta say, I, I, I did, uh, after seeing some of the performance, I, I did leave quite encouraged for the reason we've all kind of outlined already, which is that like these people are really out of ideas. Yeah. Uh, they've just yeah. totally run out of ideas. I mean, you mentioned Little Nas X. <laughs> This exact thing was already done. I mean, it was done in a more shocking way even then. It was a, he, was, he was like giving a lap dance to Satan. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But even then, at that time, you're like, okay, I've seen this. Um, um, this exact yeah. imagery right. has been used well, so they, many he, times. But, here, it wasn't well, but this, is the thing, this is the thing. Tribal, uh, tribalism, cultural ubiquity, uh, the, the purity grift, it is boring. Because you, the thing you actually can't do in the transhumanist moment, the thing you actually can't do is transgress the popular opinion of your tribe right now. Yeah, and so to be a political purist isn't to have the right ideas. It's to see which ideas are the most in vogue and then just emulate them, just just repeat them back. So all that he did is he said, oh, Lil Nas X did this and it worked. I'll do it. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's derivative for a reason. It's derivative by design. There's a reason that in dictatorships, everybody dresses like the dictator. There's a reason that communist countries can't produce art. It's, it's this because you... Yeah. Because art, because art is transgressive. Because you're trying to make, you're trying to make statements that are not always in vogue. You're trying to challenge uh, an audience. You're trying to. Well, speaking of purity, I Jeremy, oh, I, you know, speaking of purity yeah. and how to keep one's flesh Except really, really nice and <laughs> Much gleaming than what and I did. beautiful. And I'm excited to tell you about Genucel skincare. Their most popular package can take 10 to 15 years off your skin. Right now, you can get it for 70% off with their latest breakthrough in skincare technology, a probiotic moisturizer, absolutely free. I love GenuCell. I have used GenuCell myself because I was very skeptical. I said, I don't want to endorse something if I don't know that it works. It works. It turns out probiotics are not just good for digestion. They can have the same nourishing benefits on your skin. Probiotic extracts target bad bacteria on the surface of your skin to restore balance to your skin's microbiome or your macrobiome. I like to think that I've got a full biome going on in my skin for noticeably clearer complexion and visibly younger appearance. And actually, my favorite thing about GenuCell, other than the fact that it's a great product, it was founded by a great guy, a guy with an amazing story, Coptic Christian pharmacist from Egypt. He left Egypt to pursue the American dream. He started making skincare products at the request of just one local customer. He sold it to her at material cost, never expected to make any money from it, didn't expect repeat orders. He just fulfilled this order. Amazed by the results, 
the customer's entire fr- a group of friends came over. Uh, they, they started calling in orders days after using it. 20 years later, George still formulates every product, and every product is still produced with the same level of goodness as the first. I just love the guy's story. He's He's fighting the same kind of things that we're fighting, fighting for the right stuff. With GenuCell skincare, mm. you will see results in under 12 hours. Guaranteed or your money back. Go to GenuCell.com slash backstage right now. For the first time ever, every order from now until Valentine's Day includes a beauty box with two luxury gifts, yours free. Order now because you've only got one week. That is GenuCell.com slash backstage. GenuCell.com slash backstage. <gasps> It's so brave. <laughs> Won't shoot it down. <laughs> Let it flow <laughs> above my head. What should we do? Yeah. What should we it's, do? No, no, no. I, I just want to be clear that I uh, I ordered them not to do this joke, but I was overruled by my generals. <laughs> so did, <laughs> so just, did, I, I heard somewhere we have a hundred million dollar entertainment budget. <laughs> <laughs> How much when? Ten percent for the big guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be there the whole time now. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be here for eight days, actually. Yeah, it's only yeah, it's going to fly over all of our important installations, yeah. and then it'll, it'll be. I didn't know it was an actual balloon. That's that's yeah. surprising. It, <laughs> yeah. Sophisticated technology, <laughs> my hearing aid and or Corvette. Does it contain classified documents? <laughs> what what what's in it? No one this is, knows. The, the this comedy is, on this show has just been tremendous. I was going to say, this is the death. Like, we just lost 20,000 viewers. <laughs> There's no way anyone... You deserve to lose that. Yeah. What is he? Oh, my is he God. Your Mr. Hair? President, yeah. Mr. President, not again, Mr. President. <laughs> this is the most fun we're going to have before he starts actually speaking. So wow. let's bring it all out. Today, Jen Psaki said... <laughs> no, Ms. Ritz, not Jen. I'm a storyteller. So I want to tell you a little story. You're not even moving the mouth while you're... <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to do this? <laughs> no, Walsh. No, I don't. <laughs> Dog-faced <laughs> pony soul. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was standing with me in Scranton, Pennsylvania. One day on a street. Corner. Watching Sam Smith. Watch. <laughs> uh, two men. And Mr. President, you walked with MLK, right? You walked I did, with... I did, but let me, finish, let me finish my story. <laughs> it's funnier when the mouth moves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th- thank you. I can't do it all the time. Not much. <laughs> and um, there were two men going at it like jackhammers on a street. And my father said, Joey, Joey said, that's what love looks like. And I said, thanks, pop, corn pop. <laughs> that's another story. No, no, no more stories. <laughs> the thank Mr. you, Mr. President. President. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Oh, are we, are we? Uh, no. No, that's enough, Mr. President. The eyes are so realistic. Now I'm looking forward to the State of the Union. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they say there's no great comedy at the Daily Wire. <laughs> that was me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> What about this balloon guy? <laughs> yeah, we haven't talked about the balloon. We probably should, Mr. President. I think we all got played with this whole balloon story. I agree. I think the whole thing is just a sham to get them out of having to go have their meeting with the Chai Coms, right? And to get us to stop talking about Pfizer, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It's amazing. We finally, there's a huge release on all this information. The, you get the guy who was a year below me in college, oddly enough, the, the Pfizer exec guy. He's there. He says, yeah, we're doing directed evolution, gain of function research. Yeah, it t- definitely affects menstruation. Yeah, this, that, and the other thing. And then what? All of a sudden they say, hey, look, a squirrel. Look up there. Hey, look, there's a shiny object in the sky. Oh, and then we all fall really, for it. Do you really think they were just trying to get other Chinese... Conference? Yes. Wow. Why? Why would you think that? Because I think that the Chinese are spying on us all the time. And why? Is it did- Montana? <laughs> yeah, but this is a balloon. <laughs> this balloon was the size of five Greyhound buses. They keep showing it like as a thing at a carnival. It was enormous. And it's like, well, you know, you can't let them fly. It was them. carrying the wizard. Well, I agree wizard. that you. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I agree that you shouldn't, that we should oppose Chinese spying, but they didn't even stop. They didn't even do that. Yeah, they didn't. They sure. just blew it up, made a big news story, drug it out for as long as the news cycle would allow oh, for it to you're go. Attributing cleverness. It to, yeah. <laughs> oh, I look smart. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what happened is that he's an idiot. And he was like, oh, look, some, my, my generals told me that there is a Chinese spy balloon above American soil. Perhaps no one will see it. After all, I cannot, since I'm <laughs> clinically blind. And a bunch of people in Montana looked up in the sky and behold, an enormous spy balloon. And they said, a spy balloon. 
And Joe Biden said, uh, <laughs> and nothing. Donald Trump gazed for, directly into the sun <laughs> looking yeah. for it. And for eight days, it floated above American soil, moving slowly past all American military <laughs> installations. <laughs> and then the, the, I can tell you, the, honestly, like the proof is in the pudding. The timeline is obvious. This thing was crossing American soil early last week. And, and on about Friday, this started to become a major issue for Joe Biden. And everyone on the left came out and said, you can't shoot this thing down. Why would we shoot this thing down? We can never shoot it down. If you question him shooting the thing down, it's because you just don't understand foreign policy or politics. Of course he's not going to shoot it down. They were fully in control. And then Saturday morning, the schmuck comes out. <laughs> and he's like, well, you, oh, I said on Wednesday, <laughs> we should shoot it down. And apparently everybody ignored him. And then it floats all the way to the ocean. It's like, it's over water now. <laughs> and, and then they send the F-22 to kill it. Like, it's, the whole thing is ridiculous. And the, the clearest attempt that it was obvious indicator that it was an attempt to backfill is that they sent out anonymous Defense Department officials yes. who tried to claim that this happened during the Trump administration. Right. Unbelievable. It's that a was lie. It did not happen during John the Trump Bolton administration. John Bolton said it wasn't true. They were calling him xenophobic, hate Chinese people, Trump. and then now they're like, oh no, he did let them float balloons. I mean, that was the most ridiculous part. The it PR was. maneuver to try to blame Trump was like, wow. And then you saw the response after all the officials, not just pro-Trump ones, but John Bolton, you mentioned, he said, I've heard any of this. They said, oh, well, yeah, we, no, they, they were there. But we didn't but we see missed, him. We, we missed, missed it. it. Yeah, yeah missed but we definitely know You're they right, happened. That's totally the same thing as a giant Chinese spy balloon floating across <laughs> the entire continent of the United South, States yeah. over the course of a week. Can I, I just, can I just, uh, up to twist it into a dog. Though. Are you, <laughs> are you going to hold that the whole time? <laughs> I think he has to. Me? How dare, how dare yeah. you this suggest the that president. the president yeah. is a meat puppet of other people, controlled <laughs> by others, yeah. outsiders. The president is his own paper bag. Is that How dare you, sir? Is that what symbolism is? I don't yeah, that's yeah, well, you're the one who said that. Yeah, hold on. I'm seeing symbols. Who's going to be the most excited when he comes in? That's what you really wonder, right? Like when he walks in and they do yeah, like, the, they, they all pretend to be excited and like as if our Yo, world. did you see? We have oh, to great. Oh, Can we talk so about his guests? So great to see you guys. I invited Bono because he's famous. <laughs> like why is it like, why is why Bono, is Bono there? You know, I, mean, about I hope they fly warming, the Ukrainian Bono. flag again. And Bono, I mean, this is crazy. Literally, what is he doing here? I told you, when I was when I was a young man, when I was an actor, I had a job as a fake sommelier at George Soros' wedding. It's one of my weirdest jobs I ever had. Do you know who was at the wedding? Bono. Bono. <laughs> He's at like every liberal I, event I, I in the world. I love the excuse yeah. that they have for this. So clearly they invited Paul Pelosi so that Joe Biden can point up there and be like, and there were people, there were people in this room who wanted him to be hit in the head by a weird naked man. <laughs> <laughs> who he'd called for some game. Right, exactly. <laughs> that, that's, that, that is why they're doing that. Other people he, are, are a bunch of cancer survivors so that he can talk about his cancer moonshot because as we all know, the thing that prohibits science from solving cancer is that we don't have sufficient commitment <laughs> to solving cancer. <laughs> yeah. That's it. If we just focus on cancer more, mm -hmm. that will do it. So that, mm -hmm. That's an exciting one. And he's also having the family of Tyree Nichols who they didn't care about five minutes ago and will not care about five minutes from now. But Joe Biden can pretend that he cares deeply about the fate of- Yeah, Ben, you talked about this on your show last week about how disgusting it is that politicians show up at funerals like that. Yeah. At, I'd never actually thought about it. It is genuinely it's disgusting. Gross. It's you so listen gross. to the speeches that Kamala Harris and Al Sharpton gave at that funeral, and it is just a political stump. It's gross, and they do it all the time. Wait, so you remember the Paul Wellstone funeral, where they where they showed up at the Paul Wellstone funeral. Paul Wellstone was a senator from Minnesota. He died in a plane crash, and they basically oh, yeah. held a political rally. Yeah, yeah. And then you remember that there was the Arizona shooting, and Barack Obama showed up at the yeah. memorial for victims of the Arizona shooting. He did a whole gun control pitch. Yeah. And then he did the same thing in Dallas. And the people showing up randomly at the funerals of people they don't know and then giving speeches there yeah. Yeah. is disgusting. I mean, I'm sorry. George it's Floyd's really, funeral, the yeah, three-day funeral. Right, Could anything just, have been grosser than that? Everybody stop talking and let me do an ad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, like me, you're a small but incredibly attractive business, you don't want to go and wait online at the post office because the women won't leave you alone. One of the <laughs> best ways to avoid that is by using Stamps.com to mail and ship. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels right from your home or office. It's ready to go in minutes so you can get back to running your business sooner. Postage rates just increased again, but Stamps.com offers the best discounts in the industry. They've teamed up with the USPS and UPS to get you huge mailing and shipping discounts of up to 86% off. Plus, they automatically tell you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Get access to the shipping services you need to run your business right from your computer. No lines, no traffic, no waiting 
You can print postage wherever you do business. They even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. Set your business up for success by getting started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code BACKSTAGE for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code BACKSTAGE. I only wish... (laughs) <laughs> hair for me to smell. <laughs> <laughs> can we don't let that stop you? Baby. Can we talk? Can we talk about the Paul Pelosi thing for a second? We just saw Paul Pelosi. Can we yeah. talk about the Paul Pelosi thing for a second because I think it was a it was a totally botched. Uh, the conservatives botched the whole story completely. Of course. By, by you know, and and I don't blame people for speculating because they're being weirdly secretive about things. Mm-hmm. They just released a 911 tape. Selective and then, leaks. Right, and then and then we find out later that they only didn't release it because the 911 operator completely makes a fool of herself and I think that's that that was the issue with that but the real story with the whole which I said from the beginning it's like I, it, it's very plausible that this really was just a a homeless drug addict in San Francisco that, that broke into the house there's no reason to get into any theories about uh gay lovers and all that kind of stuff damn so the real the real story is that the crime problem in San Francisco is so bad. Is yep. so bad that even Nancy Pelosi's house isn't safe. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. and that should have always been the point. But instead, we went into this whole thing about well, I do think I do think one thing that is true though is that you know when these incidents tend to happen to her, they keep it very hush hush. Let's just give you an example on the right. Brad Parscale, when he got arrested, that yeah, yeah. tape was out before he made it into the cruiser. It was like circulating <laughs> on Twitter. It was mm-hmm. unbelievable how quickly it was released. And for whatever reason, when it involves her husband, it's so hush hush. They go through everything not to give the public yep. any information. In this situation, actually, when it actually was revealed, I thought this would have helped them. Right? It actually would have put to bed a lot of the conspiracies. When I saw it, as much as I detest Nancy Pelosi, you can't see an 80 year old get hit like that and not feel a tremendous. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I was like. Wow, I feel really bad that he actually went through this. This is an old man that's getting beat up in his own house. And you hear the call, and it's like he's in such pain for the dis- dispatcher to understand. No, this is a hostage situation. He's not being subtle, I need you to just, you know, have a basic level IQ he's here to, to understand. Like, right, okay, we'll bye. He's like, no, 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 no. Um, no, not bye. You know, Remember mistake. how they originally played it, that she did an amazing job? Yeah. She saw the subtle they did for like weeks. It was yeah, they saw did. the subtleties of what he was saying, and she could see his coded language. Yeah. It, it really was. An amazing thing. And they thing. took down that reporter but, on NBC, and he actually factually stated, so there was a lot of room for conspiracy because right. they were being... What I said at the time, I said at the time, it is perfectly plausible that this was exactly as it has been described yes. to us. But the problem is they've created an environment where it is also plausible that if Paul Pelosi were hit in the head by a gay naked lover, yeah. they also wouldn't tell us. And like, the, other, the, media, the media is now so uninvested and ever scrutinizing anything that's that could have any negative consequence for the Democrats, that we're ready for the conspiracy is happening all the time right there in the, the open. Question so we're, we're all, ready to not believe or believe anything on that basis. We were all asking who's lying and who's covering up. Is it the Democrats or the Republicans? W- what everybody seemed to miss here is there was a third party that could have been lying and trying to hush stuff up, and it was the cops. Who, who released the information to the press that, oh, actually, he referred to the invader as a friend on the phone call? Who released to the press, oh, he was in his underwear? Oh, he had a drink? Oh, he had this? It was the cops who were releasing that to fuel the conspiracy theories to cover their own derrieres because they were incompetent. So can we talk for a second about like what the political situation is for Joe Biden going into the State of the Union? Because I, I, I know, I know. If I, we have I, to. I hate the State of the Union more than any of you, probably all of you combined with the fiery, passionate hatred of a thousand <laughs> sons. I mean, I, 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 I despise it. I think it's a monarchic institution that elevates the, the Article II branch of government above the Article I branch of government. Well, what's the Those problem? are references to articles that, that Joe Biden's judges don't know about. <laughs> um, and, um, and the pathetic spectacle of a doddering old fool walking down the aisle to the throngs of cheering morons, pretending that they like him and care about him, while we all sit here for 60 minutes and watch him read a canned speech from a teleprompter in which he pledges to do a bunch of things that he will not do and lies a bunch, is the worst thing in the world. But what exactly is he trying to do? Is this, as they say, the launch of his of his second successful president? Well, I was going to say a second presidential campaign, then I had to correct myself because he's run for president like one million times. Yeah, that's right. um, so he, presumably he's, he's running again, or at least being ambulatorily wheeled again <laughs> uh, toward, toward the presidency. What does he have to do here? Well, I think that the one thing that always gets me about Joe Biden is after four years of listening to how Donald Trump lied about this and lied about that, and no one's going to defend Donald Trump as the icon of truth. He was kind of a carny barker, exaggerated things. 
This guy lies with such aggression oh, yeah. that it's offensive. It is offensive to be told that you can afford bread when you can't. It's offensive to be told that everything is tickety-boo when everything is going down the crapper. This, this Im- immediate moment, he has had this jobs report, which I, I'm suspicious of. I, I'm, not sure I, I'm not sure I believe this job, jobs report, which has cut the unemployment rate to something like its lowest uh, level in, which, by, by the way, is ba- actually bad for inflation, which is our real problem. Right now, we're, we have this tremendous problem that ordinary people are having a hard time buying the staples. That is the that is the state well, of play. Would you like me to explain the jobs report, by the way? The reason <laughs> that the jobs report came in hot at 500,000 is because they underestimated the jobs growth in November, December. And so when you average it all out, it oh, doesn't so, look so nearly as time. good. Right, exactly. So you, you tend to get these kind of like weird yeah. snake ate the rabbit kind of bumps sometimes in the employment but, markets. But the real problem is that there's only one chart that matters, and that is the line of employment before the pandemic versus after the pandemic. Right. So if you look at the line of employment before the pandemic, it looks like this. The pandemic hits. If if that line were to continue, it would be in this trajectory. There is a, the, the pandemic hits, the job market goes boom, plummets. When it starts to recover under Trump, it takes a V shape, right? It goes like directly straight up back toward that line, that original line, and then Joe Biden takes office and it levels off. And so it's been trailing almost in parallel, what the line should be, except there's all these missing jobs. So all those missing jobs are missing. So we've regained the jobs that we lost during the pandemic, but we should be well ahead of that considering that we're now two years out of the pandemic. But the important thing is you have polls showing more people than ever saying they're uh, unhappy with the government. That the go- A, the government is the biggest problem we're facing. That's the largest uh, problem, according to the polls. B, people say they're worse off than they were two years ago. Uh, a, a record number of people say that they are doing uh, worse than they were doing uh, two years ago. And a record number of people are saying that the government is going in the wrong direction. To have this guy stand up and say everything is great, it's, it's just its just insulting, you know? And it's so it's boring and insulting, which is just a bad combination. I'll tell you what's not a bad comment. <laughs> Black Rifle Coffee in your cup every single morning. You see, that's how you guys do it if you were professionals. That was good. That was good. Yeah, bravo, that's bravo. Right bravo. So here's the deal, folks. I have three kids and a fourth on the way and a new puppy, which means I don't get any sleep at all in my life is a living misery. But I also have Black Rifle Coffee to keep me awake during the day so I can bring you the best in entertainment and content. Yes, up to and including paper dolls of Joe Biden. Black Rifle Coffee. <laughs> is roasted by a veteran-led team of brilliant coffee graders here in the United States. Their founder, Evan Hafer, has actually scoured the planet for the perfect beans, and they are right here in my hand. Behold! Ensuring they've passed the most stringent standards of excellence. They're constantly coming out with new roasts to try, like their most recent Beware the Delaware Roast. It's true, you might find classified documents there. You can sign up for a coffee club subscription and have Black Rifle coffee delivered straight to your door on a schedule, not to mention, Black Rifle is doing amazing work for our nation's veterans. This year alone, Black Rifle Coffee donated over 120,000 bags of coffee to veterans and first responders while expanding their own team of active duty service members, veterans, and veteran family members. Go to blackriflecoffee.com, use promo code backstage at checkout for 10% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. That's blackriflecoffee.com. Use promo code backstage for 10% off. You can also find Black Rifle Coffee in grocery and convenience stores near you. Black Rifle Coffee is America's coffee. And if you wish to have the smells of heaven to guide you away from the satanic smells of the Grammys, this is the coffee to do it. Black Rifle Coffee. Magnificent. <laughs> it smells like victory. <laughs> You win. You that killed it. I believe. Honestly, if I had Fire to rate, that was, that was, that yeah, was, that's correct. No, you're getting strong now. Never heard better. <laughs> you're getting strong. Uh, yeah, I think that it's true. Donald Trump's lies were so offensive because of the way in which he lied. And when I say they were offensive, you people, mean hilarious. People will get angry with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were, they were hilarious. People get angry, but they were offensive. They offended our sensibilities because we were used to being lied to the other way. Like all of our, all of our sensibilities were sort of formed to embrace political lies. And then he came along and offended those sensibilities. Hmm. And in some ways, that was his superpower when hmm. he did it for the good. When he, when he did it for to cover his own rear end when he was doing bad things, uh, when he was not being fully honest, it was a bad thing. That's Trump was a mixed bag, and he's an. Ex- He's extreme well, in so both you directions. Did, you Extremely didn't his good. Lies in the same way right. because he did that. But but they offended. They did offend the political sensibility, and this is why the left really thought he was Hitler. This is why people were weeping in the streets and all this crazy stuff. That I mean, people lost their minds. The strange thing about politics is that Joe Biden's lies are so much more consequential. Yeah. They're so planned. much more damning. They're so much. They're planned. They're so much yeah. more planned. Yeah, yeah. He is a he is a truly one of the most corrupt people in American public life, in our lifetimes, but his lies do not offend the sensibilities of the public. And so 
people at home can't afford eggs, and he's going to get up there and say that we have a great economy, and people will feel offense, but they'll look around, and there won't be anybody screaming that's in the streets, the, the and there won't be any journalists fainting, and there won't be any celebrities you know, threatening to leave the country, and so they go... No, they'll be defending the lies. But that's, yeah. but that's so the, the press doing that. They create that atmosphere. Yeah, I don't well, I, I understand that, that that's I what it is. people at home are, are, like, the Democrat people that I know and am friends with and that are in my family, actually, they are offended. Like, yeah, and I, hope so. I think that we don't believe so because the press pretends not to be offended, and, and we take that... Yeah, and the press is telling us, oh, it's not a big deal, and they keep moving on. But the average American, I think, is suffering mm -hmm. enough. They understand that they're being lied to. They're not happy with the entire balloon gate, Chinese balloon gate. And so I do think that there is this disparity between what the press says and what the people actually feel. And I think that's shown by, you know, CNN suffering, their numbers and things of that nature, because they're no longer seeing their viewpoints reflected in what they're watching. Numbers is a kind word to use about their audience. And also to, an to answer <laughs> the, the original... To answer the original question, what does he need to do tonight politically? Yes. <laughs> the, the answer, of talk course. Talk to the bag, man. That's it. No, I refuse. <laughs> I'm here. I'm talking to the camera. The answer, of course, is that it really doesn't matter at all what he says in the State of the Union. Like, the State of the Union has zero political impact yeah. whatsoever. I, I don't think there's any evidence that it, that it that affects the polls, you know, in, in any kind of long standing way at all like you know i don't think so it just not, not people, in a year before an election year yeah well, i mean this even, people whatever happens tonight everyone has forgotten it by thursday at the latest matt right would you like some ice cream <laughs> is donald, donald trump has already forgot or, i'm sorry uh, yeah, joe, joe biden, biden has already done. forgotten did now. you see the washington post column today saying uh, the headline i'm not getting it verbatim but it's pretty close Eggs are not really that expensive. I love that. When love you that. really, it was the thesis was when you really think about it. You know, when you really think. I know you're paying five, <laughs> six, ten, fifteen dollars for eggs. When you can get them, they were sold out the other day at my grocery store. Oh yeah. Uh, they're not. It's really actually. These are not the droids you're looking for. They're actually. These are not very expensive eggs. I was That's, a chicken farmer once. <laughs> no, <laughs> no you, you were not. Were Mr. you, Mr. President? You know, it goes into the bag no, and just smacks it. Yeah. <laughs> This is this is the thing, though, that when when there is no social proof to reinforce your the thing that you're feeling inside, you tend to second guess yourself. And I think this is part of what explains the poor showing that we had on election night. It, it also why did Barack Obama, Barack Obama won re-election with the worst sort of economic indicators of any president who'd won re-election in modern life? But there was no social proof to validate the yeah. way that people felt. This is the power that the media has. We forget that, that Obama had the advantage of that uh, 2008 crash. So even though his economic numbers, we knew his economic numbers were bad, but they were better than when he took office and, and got the entire press corps uh, with him. And so they kept saying, oh, there was so much better, such an improvement, so great. I mean, there was a there was a piece in the New York Times today, I think it was, on the op-ed page, or Knucklehead Row, as I call it, where Michelle Goldberg. He is so one, funny. No, he's, such he, a great piece. She's, she's a wonderful columnist because she sees like a sort of shadow. She sees the truth, but she's not allowed to think outside of the New York Times uh, philosophy, so she can't quite grasp what it is. Yeah. So she wrote this thing saying, well, this is a great president. This is a great, great mm -hmm. president. <laughs> Just so, it's like, it was like listening to somebody. Well, like, he missed the second sentence. It was, he's a great president, but he shouldn't run again. But he shouldn't which run is again. The, which yeah. is the first time, which, yeah. which, by the way, is kind of the subtle mm. undertones to a lot of what the... The problem for the Democrats, of course, is that the people backing her up are Kamala Harris, the least talented human being maybe ever to walk the earth. I mean, she, it, it, is, yeah. it is truly astonishing, the levels of talent that she does not have. Yeah. Like they, they are nearly infinite. It's like an infinite regress of talentlessness with, with, with Kamala Harris. And... Um, and so, you know, they, they kind of are wedded to her. And every so often you'll see a hit piece come out about Kamala. And it's like, okay, Pete Buttigieg in the study with the wrench. Yeah. Because you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know that he's setting all of those up. The, the truth is, I think that the best ally that Biden has is not even the media. The best ally that he has is that he is a dead person. Hmm. I'm not kidding you. It is that he is yeah. an empty bag. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Because he's, he's a deeply unthreatening yeah. human being. Like he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very threatening person in terms of his actual politics. And the stuff that he wants for the country is actually genuinely terrible, and in some cases even evil. But he is also non-threatening because you look at him, you're like, he's such a non-entity. Like, can you yeah. get... Like uh, he's honestly, walking, can, the, the president's walking uh, into the joint Well, he's, he's walking? Right it's a miracle. Yeah. It's a miracle. <laughs> and you just look at him and he... He does look so harmless. Right. It is, yeah. he is a, he's an old man See, whose me, eyes have closed because he's got so much Botox in his forehead. Senile. This is a guy, this is a guy who, who pooped his pants in front of the Pope. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, so, how, so how exactly... I wondered, how, I wondered when you'd get it in there. <laughs> yeah, he's been waiting all show for that one. Uh, the, the question, though, is how do you feel... How do you generate a sense of threat around a person who is like that? You can try to generate a sense of threat around his agenda, but he doesn't have the same sort of 
threatening right. talent. To me, See, it takes talent to be threatening. I, Barack I, Obama yeah. was a threatening president specifically because he was charismatic and talented. But I keep yeah. imagining what a textbook is going to look like 500 years from now when they show us the last president of the republic. And he's this doddering old man. Yeah. Like, this was the man they thought was going it, to... It, it's threatening in a different kind of way. I understand that he's not evil looking. No, but, it's, but, that's but he looks something like, like the, the, the end of the republic. The republic. It doesn't say something about him. Right. And that's the problem is that the American people generally don't like to look directly in the mirror. When, the, when, when, we look at the, when we look at the problems that the country faces, the reality is we can blame our politicians all we want. A lot of this is just generated by the American public. I mean, this is a democratic republic. And the fact is we keep electing these, these dolts over and over and over again. And that's why the Chinese feel so just mm-hmm. sanguine about republic. floating into nearly every <laughs> arena of American life and just, and just being a <laughs> what's what's happening right now. Uh-oh. Xi Jinping is sending us messages. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm feeling threatened. Andrew Clavin, would you like to shoot that? I was, I was thinking, you know, do you mind? I was looking for something sharper. around me. <laughs> yeah. Sputnik flying the, overhead? The, the flamethrower, Michael. The flamethrower. Yeah. Yeah, where'd the flamethrower go? <laughs> uh, no, no. Oh, oh, almost oh, got it. Got it. Oh, almost this is the most it. amusing things we'll get all night. An old man trying to prod a balloon with a cigar. <laughs> yes, we have reached that point in the broadcast and we haven't even begun. Actually, that's a, that's a great metaphor for the, the State of the Union. No, no. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. Wow. It wasn't lit enough. These, these wow. Chinese are amazing. That's <laughs> that one was made in America. <laughs> <laughs> so now here's uh, the, the president of the United States, or the husband of the president of the United States, wandering <laughs> through the room, shaking hands with a bunch of uh, Supreme Court justices and past Supreme Court justices, it looks like. Uh, and um, you have just... Kevin McCarthy standing there and Kamala Harris standing there and they clap like automatons and we all pretend that we like the president, which is always, that's always one of my favorite things about the State of the Union is where the president walks in and everybody on both sides of the aisle pretends they like him. Like for that brief moment before they start oh, they sharing his not with Trump. I want to know if that's Kevin McCarthy is right. going to tear up his, his speech. I hope so. Yeah. I hope he makes it mm-hmm. into like a, like some sort of origami thing. We may just into a swan or something. You know, what's amazing about the setting, though, I, I'm probably the most pro State of the Union person here. Not not this. I mean, this is going to be interminable and terrible. Because, you, but you're, because a you're a monarchist. Yeah, that's right. Because, you know, I'm Catholic, Italian. Right, you know? Exactly. But, but I, I like the the looks of it are so majestic. And the, the uh, idea that we're all coming together and we actually have something in common and both houses of Congress are meeting in the same place and both parties. So the that's I, fiction. Yeah, no, the, the idea of it, I mean, it might be a noble fiction, but, it, you know, it, it, I, I like it in theory. And then I, it always makes me think, why does the opposition party feel the need to give the response to the State of the Union when you're doing it from some random room somewhere with Rubio grabbing for a bottle of water and it can mm-hmm. it cannot look good. I was so sorry to see that Sarah Sanders is giving the response because I like Sarah Sanders. I think she's very talented. She's the she's... only Republican who probably won't run for president. Yeah, that, that's true. You're right. In the in 2024. But I, I just think let them has there ever been a good one, a good response? No, yeah, there never. No, there can't. cannot be for all the reasons so that Michael addled. was saying. I'm sorry, the president looks so addled. Look at him. He, he does not. Probably just had an adrenaline he's not, shot. He's not with us. He's just not with us. And he's and he's all right. up there. You know how you know this is going to be bad. You know this is going to be bad because the New York Times, before it even began, ran a piece about how he's overcoming his stammer. Mm. They did. Oh, and it's like no. that's he's been in public the life for longer speech. than I've been alive by a factor of like <laughs> two. Took him eighty years. All right, the president of the United States about to start. He's handing his speech to Kevin McCarthy. We'll be back with you at the conclusion of the speech uh, to tell you how bad it was. (laughs) We'll see you then. (laughs) Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor to present to you the President of the United States. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. You can smile. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, our First Lady and Second Gentlemen, good to see you guys up there. Members of Congress. By the way, Chief Justice, I may need a court order. She gets to go to the, the game tomorrow, uh, next week. I have to stay home. 
Got to work something out here. Members of the Cabinet, leaders of our military, Chief Justice, Associate Justice, and retired Justice of the Supreme Court, and to you, my fellow Americans. You know, uh, I start tonight by congratulating the 118th Congress and the new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Speaker, I don't want to ruin your reputation, but I look forward to working with you. <laughs> and I want to congratulate the new leader of the House Democrats, the first African-American minority leader in history, Hakeem Jeffries. He won in spite of the fact I campaigned for him. <laughs> Congratulations to the longest-serving leader in the history of the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell. Where are you, Mitch? <laughs> and congratulations to Chuck Schumer. Another, uh, you know, another term as Senate Minority Leader. Uh, you know, I think you. Uh, only this time you have a slightly bigger majority, Mr. Leader, and you're the majority leader. About that much bigger? Yeah. Well, I tell you what. I want to give special recognition to someone who I think is going to be considered the greatest speaker in the history of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. Folks, the story of America is a story of progress and resilience, of always moving forward, of never, ever giving up. It's a story unique among all nations. We're the only country that has emerged from every crisis we've ever entered stronger than we got into it. Look, folks, th that's what we're doing again. Two years ago, the economy was reeling. I stand here tonight after we've created, with the help of many people in this room, 12 million new jobs. More jobs created in two years than any president's created in four years because of you all, because of the American people. Two years ago, and two years ago, COVID had shut down. Our businesses were closed. Our schools were robbed of so much. And today, COVID no longer controls our lives. And two years ago, democracy faced its greatest threat to the Civil War. And today, though bruised, our democracy remains unbowed and unbroken. As we gather here tonight, we're writing the next chapter in the great American story, a story of progress and resilience. When world leaders ask me to define America, and they do, believe it or not, I say I can define it in one word, and I mean this, possibilities. We don't think anything is beyond our capacity. Everything is a possibility. You know, we're often told that Democrats and Republicans can't work together. But over the past two years, we've proved the cynics and naysayers wrong. Yes, we disagreed plenty. And yes, there were times when Democrats went alone. But time and again, Democrats and Republicans came together, came together to defend a stronger and safer Europe. It came together to pass one in a, gen one in a generation, once in a generation infrastructure law, building bridges connecting our nation and our people. We came together to pass the most significant law ever, helping victims expose the toxic burn pits. And in fact, It's important. And in fact, I signed over 300 bipartisan pieces of legislation since becoming president, from reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act, the Electoral Count Reform Act, 
the Respect for Marriage Act that protects the right to marry the person you love. And to my Republican friends, if we could work together the last Congress, there's no reason we can't work together and find consensus on important things in this Congress as well. I think Folks, you all are as formed as I am, but I think the people sent us a clear message. Fighting for the sake of fighting, power for the sake of power, conflict for the sake of conflict gets us nowhere. That's always been my vision of our country, and I know it's many of yours. To restore the soul of this nation, to rebuild the backbone of America, America's middle class, and to unite the country. We've been sent here to finish the job, in my view. For decades, the middle class has been hollowed out in more than — and now no one administration, but for a long time. Too many good-paying manufacturing jobs move overseas. Factories closed down. Once thriving cities and towns that many of you represent became shadows of what they used to be. And along the way, something else we lost — pride, our sense of self-worth. I ran for president to fundamentally change things, to make sure our economy works for everyone so we can all feel that pride in what we do. To build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not from the top down. Because when the middle class does well, the poor have a ladder up, and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. I know a lot of you always kid me for always quoting my dad, but my dad used to say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. He really would say this. It's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay, and mean it. Well, folks, so let's look at the results. We're not finished yet by any stretch of the imagination, but unemployment rate is at 3.4 percent, a 50-year low. A near record — a near record unemployment — near record unemployment for Black and Hispanic workers. We've already created, with your help, 800,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs, the fastest growth in 40 years. And where is it written? Where is it written that America can't lead the world in manufacturing? And I don't know where that's written. For too many decades, we imported projects and exported jobs. Now, thanks to what you've all done, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. <laughs> Folks, inflation. Inflation has been a global problem because the pandemic disrupted our supply chains, and Putin's unfair and brutal war in Ukraine disrupted en energy supplies as well as food supplies, blocking all that grain in Ukraine. But we're better positioned than any country on Earth right now. But we have more to do. But here at home, inflation is coming down. Here at home, gas prices are down $1.50 from their peak. Food inflation is coming down, not fast enough, but coming down. Inflation has fallen every month for the last six months, while take-home pay has gone up. Additionally, over the last two years, a record 10 million Americans applied to start new businesses. 10 million. And by the way, every time — every time someone starts a small business as an act of hope, and, Madam Vice President, I want to thank you for leading that effort to ensure that small businesses have access to capital and the historic laws we enacted that are going to just come into being. Standing here last year, I shared with you a story of American genius and possibilities. Semiconductors, small computer chips the size of a fingerprint that power everything, from cell phones to automobiles and so much more. These chips were invented in America. Let's get that straight. They were invented in America. We used to make 40 percent of the world's chips. In the last several decades, we lost our edge. We're down to only producing 10 percent. We all saw what happened during the pandemic when chip factories shut down overseas. Today's automobiles need 3,000 chips, each of those automobiles. 
but American automobiles couldn't make enough cars because there weren't enough chips. Car prices went up, people got laid off. So did everything from refrigerators to cell phones. We can never let that happen again. That's why, that's why we came together to pass the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act. <clears throat> Folks, I know I've been criticized for saying this, but I'm not changing my view. We're going to make sure the supply chain for America begins in America. The supply chain begins in America. We've already created. We've already created 800,000 new manufacturing jobs without this law, before the law get, kicks in. With this new law, we're going to create hundreds of thousands of new jobs across the country. And I mean all across the country, throughout not just the coast, but through the middle of the country as well. That's going to come from companies that have announced more than $300 billion in investment in American manufacturing over the next few years. Outside of Columbus, Ohio, Intel is building semiconductor factories on a thousand acres, literally a field of dreams. It's going to create 10,000 jobs, that one investment. 7,000 construction jobs, 3,000 jobs in those factories once they're finished. They call them factories. Jobs paying an average of $130,000 a year, and many do not require a college degree. The jobs. Because we work together, these jobs where people don't have to leave home to search for opportunity. And it's just getting started. Think about the new homes, the small businesses, the big, the medium-sized businesses. So much more that's going to be needed to support those 3,000 those 3, permanent jobs and the factories that are going to be built. Talk to mayors and governors, Democrats and Republicans, and they'll tell you what this means for their communities. We're seeing these field of dreams transformed to the heartland. But to maintain the strongest economy in the world, we need the best infrastructure in the world. And folks, as you all know, we used to be number one in the world in infrastructure. We've sunk to 13th in the world. The United States of America, 13th in the world in infrastructure, modern infrastructure. But now we're coming back because we came together and passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the largest investment in infrastructure since President Eisenhower's interstate highway system. And folks, already we've, we've funded over 20,000 projects, including major airports from Boston to Atlanta to Portland. Projects that are going to put thousands of people to work rebuilding our highways, our bridges, our railroads, our tunnels, ports, airports, clean water, high-speed internet, all across America. Urban, rural, tribal. And folks, we're just getting started. We're just getting started. And I mean this sincerely. I want to thank my Republican friends who voted for the law and my Republican friends who voted against it as well. But I'm still, I, I still get asked to fund the projects in those districts as well. But don't worry. I promised I'd be a president for all Americans. We'll fund these projects. And I'll see you at the groundbreaking. Look. This law, this law will further unite all of America. Projects like Brent Sprint Bridge in Kentucky over the Ohio River, built 60 years ago, badly needed repairs, one of the nation's most congested freight routes, carrying $2 billion worth of freight every single day across the Ohio River. And folks, I've been talking about fixing it for decades, but we're really finally going to get it done. I went there last month with Democrats and Republicans and from both states to deliver a commitment of $1.6 billion for this project. 
And while I was there, I met a young woman named Sarah, who's here tonight. I don't know where Sarah is. Is she up in the box? I don't know. Sarah, how are you? Well, Sarah, for 30 years, for 30 years, I learned, she told me she'd been a proud member of the Iron Workers Local 44, known as known as the Cowboys in the Sky. The folks who built, built Cincinnati's skyline. Sarah said she can't wait to be 10 stories above the Ohio River building that new bridge. God bless her. That's pride. And that's what we're also building. We're building back pride. Look, we're also replacing poisonous lead pipes that go into 10 million homes in America. 400,000 school and child care centers. So every child in America, every child in America can drink the water instead of having permanent damage to their brain. Look, we're making sure, <clears throat> we're making sure that every community, every community in America has access to affordable high-speed internet. No parent should have to drive by McDonald's parking lot to help them do their homework online with their kids, which many thousands were doing across the country. And when we do these projects, and again, I get criticized for this, but I make no excuses for it, we're going to buy American. We're going to buy American. Folks. And it's totally, it's totally consistent with international trade rules. Buy America has been the law since 1933, but for too long, past administrations, Democrat and Republican, have fought to get around it. Not anymore. Tonight, I'm announcing new standards require all construction materials used in federal infrastructure projects to be made in America. Made in America. I mean it. Lumber, glass, drywall, fiber optic cable, and on my watch, American roads, bridges, and American highways are going to be made with American products as well. Folks, my economic plan is about investing in places and people that have been forgotten. So many of you listen to me tonight. I know you feel it. So many of you felt like you've just simply been forgotten. Amid the economic upheaval of the past four decades, too many people have been left behind and treated like they're invisible. Maybe that's you watching from home. Remember the jobs that went away. You remember them, don't you? The folks at home remember them. You wonder whether the path even exists anymore for your children to get ahead without having to move away. Well, that's why I get that. That's why we're building an economy where no one's left behind. Jobs are coming back. Pride is coming back because choices we made in the last several years. You know, this is, in my view, a blue-collar blueprint to rebuild America and make a real difference in your lives at home. For example, too many of you lay in bed at night like my dad did, staring at the ceiling, wondering what in God's name happens if, his, if your spouse gets cancer or your child gets deadly ill or something happens to you, what are you going to get money to pay for those medical bills? Or are you going to have to sell the house or try to get a second mortgage on it? I get it. I get it. With the Inflation Reduction Act that I signed into law, we're taking on powerful interest to bring health care costs down so you can sleep better at night with more security. You know, we pay more for prescription drugs than any nation in the world. Let me say it again. We pay more for prescription drugs than any major nation on Earth. For example, one in 10 Americans has diabetes. Many of you in this chamber do, and in the audience. But every day, millions need insulin to control their diabetes so they can literally stay alive. Insulin's been around for over 100 years. The guy who invented it didn't even patent it because he wanted it to be available for everyone. 
It cost the drug companies roughly $10 a vial to make that insulin. Package it in all, you may get up to $13. But Big Pharma has been unfairly charging people hundreds of dollars, four to five hundred dollars a month, making ref re record profits. Not anymore. Not anymore. <clears throat> So, so many things that we did are only now coming to fruition. We said we were doing this, and we said we passed the law to do it, but people didn't know because the law didn't take effect until January 1 of this year. We capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors on Medicaid. The people are just finding out. I'm sure you're getting the same calls I'm getting. Look, there are millions of other Americans who do not or are not on Medicare, including 200,000 young people with type 1 diabetes and need this insulin to stay alive. Let's finish the job this time. Let's cap the cost of insulin for everybody at $35. Folks, the big farmers are still going to do very well, I promise you all. I promise you they're going to do very well. This law, so, this law also caps and won't even go into effect until 2025. It costs out-of-pocket drug costs for seniors on Medicare at a maximum of $2,000 a year. You don't have to pay more than $2,000 a year, no matter how much your drug costs are. Because you know why? You all know it. Many of you, like many in my family, have cancer. You know the drugs can range from $10,000, $11,000, $14,000, $15,000 for the cancer drugs. And if drug prices rise faster than inflation, drug companies are going to have to pay Medicare back the difference. And we're finally, we're finally giving Medicare the power to negotiate drug prices, bringing down Bringing down prescription drug costs doesn't just save seniors' money. It cuts the federal deficit by billions of dollars, by hundreds of billions of dollars, because these prescription drugs are drugs purchased by Medicare to make, keep their commitment to the seniors. Well, guess what? Instead of paying four or five hundred bucks a month, you're paying 15. That's a lot of savings for the federal government. And by the way, why wouldn't we want that? Now, some members here are threatening, and I know it's not an official party position, so I'm not going to exaggerate, but threatening to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. As my coach, that's okay, that's fair. As my football coach used to say, lots of luck in your senior year. <laughs> Make no mistake, if you try anything to raise the cost of presenting jobs, I will veto it. Look, I'm pleased to say that more Americans have health insurance now than ever in history. A record 16 million people are enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. And thanks, thanks to the law I signed last year, saving millions are saving $800 a year on their premiums. And by the way, that law was written and the benefit expires in 2025. So my plea to some of you, at least in this audience, let's finish the job and make these savings permanent. Expand coverage of Medicaid. Look, the Inflation Reduction Act is also the most significant investment ever in climate change. Ever. Lowering utility bills, creating American jobs, leading the world to a clean energy future. I visited the devastating aftermath of record floods, droughts, storms, and wildfires. 
from Arizona, New Mexico, to all the way up to the Canadian border. More timber has been burned, as I've observed from helicopters, than the entire state of Missouri. And we don't have global warming? Not a problem. In addition to emergency recovery, from Puerto Rico to Florida to Idaho, we're rebuilding for the long term. New electric grids that are able to weather major storms and not prevent those fire forest fires. Roads and water systems will stand the next big flood. Clean energy to cut pollution and create jobs in communities often left behind. We're going to build 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations installed across the country by tens of thousands of IBW workers. And we're helping families save more than $1,000 a year with tax credits to purchase electric vehicles and efficient, and efficient appliances, energy efficient appliances. Historic conservation efforts to be responsible stewards of our land. Let's face reality. The climate crisis doesn't care if you're in a red or blue state. It's an existential threat. We have an obligation, not to ourselves, but to our children and grandchildren, to confront it. I'm proud of how, the, how America, at last, is stepping up to the challenge. We're still going to need oil and gas for a while. But guess what? No, we do. But there's so much more to do. We've got to finish the job. And we pay for these investments in our future by finally making the wealthiest and biggest corporations begin to pay their fair share. Just begin. Look, I'm a capitalist. I'm a capitalist, but pay your fair share. I think a lot of you at home, a lot of you at home agree with me and many people that you know the tax system is not fair. It is not fair. Look, the idea that in 2020, 55 of the largest corporations in America, the Fortune 500, made $40 billion in profits and paid zero in federal taxes? Zero? Folks, it's simply not fair. But now, because of the law I signed, billion-dollar companies have to pay a minimum of 15 percent. God love them. 15 percent. That's less than a nurse pays. And let me be crystal clear. I said at the very beginning, under my plans, as long as I'm president, nobody earning less than $400,000 will pay an additional penny in taxes. Nobody, not one penny. But let's finish the job. There's more to do. We have to reward work, not just wealth. Pass my proposal for the billionaire minimum tax. You know, there's a thousand billionaires in America. It's up from about 600 in the beginning of the term. But no billionaire should be paying a lower tax rate than a school teacher or a firefighter. Well, I mean it. Think about it. I mean, look. I know you aren't enthusiastic about that, but think about it. Think about it. Have you noticed Big Oil just reported its profits, record profits? Last year, they made $200 billion in the midst of a global energy crisis. I think it's outrageous. Why? They invested too little of that profit to increase domestic production. And when I talk to a couple of them, they say, well, we're afraid you're going to shut down all the oil wells and all the uh, oil refineries anyway, so why should we invest in them? I said, we're going to need oil for at least another decade. And that's going to exceed <laughs> and beyond that. We're going to need it. Production. If they had, in fact, invested in the production to keep gas prices down, instead, they used the record profits to buy back their own stock rewarding the CEOs and shareholders. Corporations ought to do the right thing. That's why I propose we quadruple the tax on corporate stock buybacks and encourage long-term long investments. They'll still make considerable profit. 
Let's finish the job and close the loopholes that allow very wealthy to avoid paying their taxes. Instead of cutting the number of audits for wealthy taxpayers, I just signed a law to reduce the deficit by $114 billion by cracking down on wealthy tax cheats. That's being fiscally responsible. In the last two years, my administration has cut the deficit by more than $1.7 trillion, the largest deficit reduction in American history. <clears throat> Under the previous administration, the American deficit went up four years in a row. Because those record deficits, no president added more to the national debt in any four years than my predecessor. Nearly 25 percent of the entire national debt that took over 200 years to accumulate was added by just one administration alone, the last one. They're the facts. Check it out. Check it out. How did Congress respond to that debt? They did the right thing. They lifted the debt ceiling three times without preconditions or crisis. They paid American bills to prevent an economic disaster to the country. So tonight, I'm asking the Congress to follow suit. Let's commit here tonight to the full faith and credit of the United States of America will never, ever be questioned. So my many of, some of my Republican friends want to take the economy hostage. I get it, unless I agree to their economic plans. All of you at home should know what those plans are. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Let me give you, anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. That means Congress doesn't vote. Well, I'm glad to see you. No, I tell you, I, I enjoy conversion. You know, it means if, if Congress doesn't keep the programs the way they are, they'd go away. Other Republicans say, I'm not saying it's a majority of you. I don't even think it's even a significant but it's being proposed by individuals. I'm not politely not naming them, but it's being proposed by some of you. Look, folks, the idea is that we're not going to be we're, we're not going to be moved into being threatened to default on the debt if we don't respond. <laughs> folks. So, folks, as we all apparently agree, Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be stopped. All right. Remember, we got unanimity. Social Security and Medicare are a lifeline for millions of seniors. Americans have to pay into them from the very first paycheck they started. So tonight, Let's all agree, and we apparently are. Let's stand up for seniors. Stand up and show them. We'll not cut Social Security. We will not cut Medicare. Those benefits belong to the American people. They earned it. And if anyone tries to cut Social Security, which apparently no one's going to do, and if anyone tries to cut Medicare, I'll stop them. I'll veto it. And look, I'm not going to allow them to take away, be taken away. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. But apparently, it's not going to be a problem. <laughs> Next month, when I offer my fiscal plan, I ask my Republican friends to lay down their plan as well. I really mean it. Let's sit down together and discuss our mutual plans together. Let's do that. I can tell you, the plan I'm going to show you is going to cut the deficit by another $2 trillion. And it won't cut a single bit of Medicare or Social Security. In fact, we're going to extend the Medicare Trust Fund at least two decades, because that's going to be the next argument. How do we make keep it solvent, right? Well, we'll not raise tax on anyone making under 400 grand, but 
will pay for it the way we talked about it, by making sure that the wealthy and big corporations pay their fair share. Look, 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 Here, here's the deal. They aren't just taking advantage of the tax code. They're taking advantage of you, the American consumer. Here's my message to all of you out there. I have your back. We're already preventing Americans from receiving surprise medical bills, stopping $1 billion surprise bills per month so far. We're protecting seniors' life savings by cracking down in nursing homes that commit fraud, endanger patient safety, prescribe drugs that are not needed. Millions of Americans can now save thousands of dollars because they can finally get a hearing aid over the counter without a prescription. Look, capitalism without competition is not capitalism. It's extortion. It's exploitation. Last year, I cracked down, with the help of many of you, on foreign shipping companies that were making you pay higher prices for every good coming into the country. I signed a bipartisan bill that cut shipping costs by 90 percent, helping American farmers, businessmen, and consumers. Let's finish the job. Pass the bipartisan legislation to strengthen, to strengthen antitrust enforcement and, for big, and prevent big online platforms from giving their own products an unfair advantage. My administration is also taking on junk fees, those hidden surcharges too many companies use to make you pay more. For example, we're making airlines show you the full ticket price up front, refund your money if your flight is canceled or delayed. We reduce exorbitant bank overdrafts by saving consumers more than $1 billion a year. We're cutting credit card late fees by 75 percent, from $30 to $8. Look, junk fees may not matter to the very wealthy, but they matter to most other folks in homes like the one I grew up in, like many of you did. They add up to hundreds of dollars a month. They make it harder for you to pay your bills or afford that family trip. I know how unfair it feels when a company overcharges you and gets away with it. Not anymore. We've written a bill to stop it all. It's called the Junk Fee Prevention Act. We're going to ban surprise resort fees that hotels charge on your bill. Those fees can cost you up to $90 a night at hotels that aren't even resorts. <laughs> we, the idea that cable, internet, and cell phone companies can charge you 200 or more if you decide to switch to another provider. Give me a break. We can stop service fees on tickets to concerts and sporting events and make companies disclose all the fees up front. And we'll prohibit airlines from charging $50 round trip for family just to be able to sit together. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. Americans are tired of being. We're tired of being played for suckers. So pass. Pass the Junk Free Prevention Act so companies stop ripping us off. For too long, workers have been getting stiffed, but not anymore. We're, getting, we're beginning to restore the dignity of work. For example, I, I, I should have known this, but I didn't until two years ago. 30 million workers have to sign non-compete agreements for the jobs they take. 30 million. So a cashier at a burger place can't walk across town and take the same job at another burger place and make a few bucks more. It just changed. But they just changed it because we exposed it. That was part of the deal, guys. Look it up. But not anymore. We're banning those agreements so companies have to compete for workers and pay them what they're worth. And I must tell you, this is bound to get a response from my friends on my left but the right. I'm so sick and tired of companies breaking the law by preventing workers from organizing. Pass the PRO Act, because business have a right. Workers have a right to form a union. And let's guarantee all workers have a living wage. 
Let's make sure working parents can afford to raise a family with sick days, paid family medical leave, affordable child care. That's going to enable millions of more people to go and stay at work. And let's restore the full child tax credit, which gave tens of millions of parents some breathing room and cut child poverty in half to the lowest level in history. And by the way, when we do all these things, we increase productivity. We increase economic growth. So let's finish the job and get more families access to affordable, quality housing. Let's get seniors who want to stay in their homes the care they need to do so. Let's give more breathing room to millions of family caregivers looking after their loved ones. Pass my plan so we get seniors and people with disabilities the home care and services they need. And support the workers who are doing God's work. These plans are fully paid for, and we can afford to do them. Restoring the dignity of work means making education an affordable ticket to the middle class. You know, when we made public education, 12 years of it, universal in the last century, we made the best educated, best paid, we became the best educated, best paid nation in the world. But the rest of the world's caught up. It's caught up. Jill, my wife, who teaches full time, has an expression. I hope I get it right, kid. Any nation that out educates us is going to outcompete us. Any nation out educates is going to outcompete us. Folks, we all know 12 years of education is not enough to win the economic competition of the 21st century. <laughs> we want to have the best educated workforce. Let's finish the job by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. Studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50 percent more likely to finish high school and go on to earn a two- or four-year degree, no matter their background they came from. Let's give public school teachers a raise. We're making progress by reducing student debt increasing Pell Grants for working and middle-class families. Let's finish the job and connect students to career opportunities starting in high school, provide access to two years of community college, the best career training in America in addition to being a pathway to a four-year degree. Let's offer every American a path to a good career, whether they go to college or not. And folks, Folks, in the midst of the COVID crisis, when schools were closed and we were shutting down everything, let's recognize how far we came in the fight against the pandemic itself. While the virus is not gone, thanks to the resilience of the American people and the ingenuity of medicine, we've broken the COVID grip on us. COVID deaths are down by 90 percent. We've saved millions of lives and opened up our country, we open our country back up, and soon we'll end the public health emergency. But that's called a public health emergency. But we'll remember the toll and pain that's never going to go away. More than a million Americans lost their lives to COVID. A million. Families grieving, children orphaned, empty chairs at the dining room table constantly reminding you that she used to sit there, remembering them. Dozens of variants and support new dozens of variants and support new vaccines and treatments. So Congress needs to fund these efforts and keep America safe. And as we emerge from this crisis stronger, we're also got to double down on prosecuting criminals who stole relief money meant to keep workers and small businesses afloat. Before I came to office, you remember, during that campaign, the big issue was about inspector generals who would protect taxpayers' dollars who were sidelined. They were fired. Many people said, we don't need them. And fraud became rampant. Last year, I told you the watchdogs are back. Since then, 
Since then, we've recovered billions of taxpayers' dollars. Now let's triple the anti-fraud strike force going after these criminals, double the statute of limitations on these crimes, and crack down on identity fraud by criminal syndicates stealing billions of dollars, billions of dollars from the American people. And the data shows that for every dollar we put into fighting fraud, the tax rates get back at least 10 times as much. It matters. It matters. Look, COVID left its scars like the spike in violent crime in 2020, the first year of the pandemic. We have an obligation to make sure all people are safe. Public safety depends on public trust, as all of us know. But too often, that trust is violated. Join us tonight are the parents of Tyree Nichols. Welcome. We had to bury Tyree last week. As many of you personally know, there's no words to describe the heartache or grief of losing a child. But imagine, imagine if you lost that child at the hands of the law. Imagine having to worry whether your son or daughter came home from walking down the street, or playing in the park, or just driving a car. Most of us in here have never had to have the talk, the talk that brown and black parents have had to have with their children. Bo, Hunter, Ashley, my children, I never had to have the talk with them. I never had to tell them if a police officer pulls you over, turn your interior lights on right away. Don't reach for your license. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Imagine having to worry like that every single time your kid got in a car. Here's what Tyree's mother shared with me when I spoke to her when I ask her how she finds the courage to carry on and speak out. With the faith of God, she said her son was, quote, a beautiful soul, and something good will come of this. Imagine how much courage and courage that takes. It's up to us, to all of us. We all want the same thing. Neighborhoods free of violence. Law enforcement, law enforcement who earns the community's trust. Just as every cop, when they pin on that badge in the morning, has a right to be able to go home at night, so does everybody else out there. Our children have a right to come home safely. Equal protection under the law is a covenant. We know police officers put their lives on the line every single night and day. And we know we ask them, in many cases, to do too much to be counselors, social workers, psychologists, responding to drug overdoses, mental health crises, and so much more. In one sense, we ask much too much of them. I know most cops and their families are good, decent, honorable people, the vast majority. But they risk. And they risk their lives every time they put that shield on. But what happened to Tyree in Memphis happens too often. We have to do better. Give law enforcement the real training they need. Hold them to higher standards. Help them succeed in keeping us safe. We also need more first responders and professionals to address the growing mental health substance abuse challenges. More resources to reduce violent crime and gun crime. More community intervention programs. More investment in housing, education, and job training. All this can help prevent violence in the first place. And when police officers or police departments violate the public trust, they must be held accountable. With the support With the support of the families of victims, civil rights groups, and law enforcement, I signed an executive order for all federal officers banning chokeholds, restricting no-knock warrants, 
and other key elements of the George Floyd Act. Let's commit ourselves to make the words of Tyler's mom true. Something good must come from this. Something good. <laughs> and all of us, all of us, Folks, it's difficult, but it's simple. All of us in, the cha in this chamber, we need to rise to this moment. We can't turn away. Let's do what we know in our hearts that we need to do. Let's come together to finish the job on police reform. Do something. Do something. That was the plea of parents who lost their children in Uvalde. I met with every one of them. Do something about gun violence. Thank God. Thank God we did. Passing the most sweeping gun safety law in three decades. That includes things like that the majority of responsible gun owners already support enhanced background checks for 18 to 21 years old, red flag laws keeping guns out of the hands of people who are a danger to themselves and others. But we know our work is not done. Join us tonight is Brandon Say a 26-year-old hero. Brandon put his college dreams on hold to be at his mom's side. His mom's side when she was dying from cancer. And Brandon... Brandon now works at the dance studio started by his grandparents. And two weeks ago, during the Lunar New Year celebrations. He heard the studio door close, and he saw a man standing there pointing a semi-automatic pistol at him. He thought he was going to die, but he thought about the people inside. And in that instant, he found the courage to act and wrestle the semi-automatic pistol away from the gunman who had already killed 11 people in another dance studio. 11. He saved lives. It's time we do the same. Ban assault weapons now. Ban them now. Once and for all. I led the fight to do that in 1994. And in, in 10 years, that ban was law. Mass shootings went down. After we let it expire in the Republican administration, mass shootings tripled. Let's finish the job and ban these assault weapons. And let's also come together on immigration. Make it a bipartisan issue once again. We know we now have a record number of personnel working to secure the border, arresting 8,000 human smugglers, seizing over 23,000 pounds of fentanyl in just the last several months. We've launched a new border plan last month. Unlawful migration from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela has come down 97 percent as a consequence of that. But American border problems won't be fixed until Congress acts. If we don't pass my comprehensive immigration reform, at least pass my plan to provide the equipment and officers to secure the border. And a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Those on temporary status, farm workers, essential workers, here in the people's house, it's our duty to protect all the people's rights and freedoms. Congress must restore the right and the... Congress must restore the right that was taken away in Roe v. Wade and protect Roe v. Wade. Give every woman a constant right. The Vice President and I are doing everything to protect access to reproductive health care and safeguard patient safety. But already, more than a dozen states are enforcing extreme abortion bans. Make no mistake about it. If Congress passes a national ban, I will veto it.
But let's also pass. Let's also pass the Bipartisan Equality Act to ensure LGBTQ Americans, especially transgender young people, can live with safety and dignity. Our strength, our strength is not just the example of our power, but the power of our example. Let's remember the world's watching. I spoke in this chamber one year ago, just days after Vladimir Putin unleashed his brutal attack against Ukraine. A murderous assault, evoking images of death and destruction Europe suffered in World War II. Putin's invasion has been a test for the ages, a test for America, a test for the world. Would we stand for the most basic of principles? Would we stand for sovereignty? Would we stand for the right of people to live free of tyranny? Would we stand for the defense of democracy? For such defense matters to us because it keeps peace and prevents open season on would-be aggressors and threatens our prosperity. One year later, we know the answer. Yes, we would, and we did. We did. And together, we did what America always does at our best. We led. We united NATO. We built a global coalition. We stood against Putin's aggression. We stood with the Ukrainian people tonight. We're once again joined by Ukrainian's ambassador to the United States. She represents not her, just her nation, but the courage of her people. Ambassador, is, our ambassador is here. United, we're in uniting our support of your country. Will you stand so we can all take a look at you? Thank you. Because we're going to stand with you as long as it takes. Our nation is working for more freedom, more dignity, more, more peace, not just in Europe, but everywhere. Before I came to office, the story was about how the People's Republic of China was increasing its power and America was failing in the world. Not anymore. We made clear, and I made clear in my personal conversations, which have been many, with President Xi, that we seek competition, not conflict. But I will make no apologies that we're investing in, to make America stronger, investing in American innovation and industries that will define the future that China intends to be dominated, investing in our alliances and working with our allies to protect advanced technologies so they will not be used against us, Modernizing our military to safeguard stability and determine, to, to deter aggression. Today, we're in the strongest position in decades to compete with China or anyone else in the world. Anyone else in the world. And I'm committed. I'm committed to work with China where we can advance American interests and benefit the world. But make no mistake about it, as we made clear last week. If China threatens our sovereignty, we will act to protect our country, and we did. Look, let's be clear. Winning the competition should unite all of us. We face serious challenges across the world. But in the past two years, democracies have become stronger, not weaker. Autocracies have grown weaker, not stronger. Name me a world leader who changed places with Xi Jinping. Name me one. Name me one. America's rallying the world to meet those challenges from climate to global health, to food insecurity, to terrorism, to territorial aggression. Allies are stepping up, spending more, and doing more. Look, the bridges we're forming between partners in the Pacific and those in the Atlantic, and those who bet against America are learning how wrong they are. It's never, ever been a good bet to bet against America. Never. Well, 
When I came to office, most assured that bipartisanship assumed was impossible, but never believed it. That's why a year ago I offered a unity agenda to the nation as I stood here. We made real progress together. We passed a law making it easy for doctors to prescribe effective treatments for opioid addiction. We passed the gun safety law making historic investments in mental health. We launched the ARPA-H drive for breakthrough in the fights against cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes, and so much more. We passed the Heath Robinson Pact Act, named after the late Iraq War veteran whose story about exposure to toxic burn kits I shared here last year. I understand something about those burn pits, but there's so much more to do. And we can do it together. Joining us tonight is a father named Doug from Newton, New Hampshire. He wrote Jill, my wife, a letter, and me as well, about his courageous daughter, Courtney. A contagious laugh, his sister's best friend, her sister's best friend. He shared the story all too familiar to millions of Americans and many of you in the audience. Courtney discovered pills in high school. It spiraled into addiction and eventually death from a fentanyl overdose. She was just 20 years old. Describing the last eight years without her, Doug said, there's no worse pain. Yet their family has turned pain to purpose, working to end the stigma and change laws. He told us he wants to start a journey toward American recovery. Doug, we're with you. Fentanyl is killing more than 70,000 Americans a year. Big, you got it. So let's launch a major surge to stop fentanyl production in the sale and trafficking with more drug detection machines, inspection cargo, stop pills and powder at the border. <laughs> Working with couriers like FedEx to inspect more packages for drugs. Strong penalties to crack down on fentanyl trafficking. Second, let's do more in mental health, especially for our children. When millions of young people are struggling with bullying, violence, trauma, we owe them greater access to mental health care at their schools. Yes. We must finally hold social media companies accountable for experimenting or doing running children for profit. <laughs> it's time to pass bipartisan legislation to stop big tech from collecting personal data on our kids and teenagers online. <laughs> Ban targeted advertising to children and impose stricter limits on the personal data that companies collect on all of us. Third, let's do more to keep this nation's one truly sacred obligation to equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home. Job training, job placement for veterans and their spouses as they come to return to civilian life. Helping veterans afford the rent because no one should be homeless in America, especially someone who served the country. <clears throat> Dennis McDonough, Dennis McDonough is here of the VA. We had a first real discussion when I asked him to take the job. I'm glad he did. We were losing up to 25 veterans a day on suicide. Now we're losing 17 a day to the silent scourge of suicide. 17 veterans a day are committing suicide. More than all the people being killed in the wars. Folks, VA is doing everything it can, including expanding mental health screening, proven programs that recruit veterans to help other veterans understand what they're going through, get them the help they need. We got to do more. And fourth, last year, Jill and I reignited the cancer moonshot that I was able to start with President Obama asked me to lead our administration on this issue. Our goal is to cut the cancer death rates at least by 50% in the next 25 years. 
turn more cancers from death sentences to treatable diseases, provide more support for patients and their families. It's personal to so many of us, so many of us in this audience. Joining us are Morris and Candice, an Irishman and the daughter of immigrants from Panama. They met and fell in love in New York City and got married in the same chapel Jill and I got married in New York City. Kindred spirits. He wrote us a letter about his little daughter, Ava, and I saw her just before I came over. She was just a year old when she was diagnosed with rare kidney disease, cancer. After 26 blood transfusions, 11 rounds of radiation, eight rounds of chemo, chemo one kidney removed, given a 5% survival rate. He wrote how, in the darkest moments, he thought, if she goes, I can't stay. Many of you have been through that as well. Jill and I understand that, like so many of you. And he read Jill's book describing our family's cancer journey and how we tried to steal moments of joy where we could with Bo. For them, that glimmer of joy was the half-smile of their baby girl. It meant everything to them. They never gave up hope. Little Ava never gave up hope. She turns four next month. They just found out Ava's beating the odds is on her way to being cured of cancer. And she's watching from the White House tonight and she's not asleep already. For the lives we can save. For the lives we can save and the lives we've lost, let this be a truly American moment that rallies the country and the world together and prove that we can still do big things. 20 years ago, under the leadership of President Bush and countless advocates and champions, he undertook a bipartisan effort through PEPFAR to transform the global fight against HIV-AIDS. It's been a huge success. He thought big. He thought large. He moved. I believe we can do the same thing with cancer. Let's end cancer as we know it. Cure some cancers once and for all. Folks, there's one reason why we've been able to do all of these things, our democracy itself. It's the most fundamental thing of all. With democracy, everything's possible. Without it, nothing is. For the last few years, our democracy has been threatened and attacked, put at risk, put to the test in this very room on January the 6th. And then just a few months ago, an unhinged big lie assailed and unleashed a political violence the home of the then Speaker of the House of Representatives, using the very same language the insurrectionists used as they stalked these halls and chanted on January 6th. Here tonight in this chamber is a man who bears the scars of that brutal attack, but is as tough and as strong and as resilient as they get. My friend Paul Pelosi. Paul, stand up. But such a heinous act should have never happened. We must all speak out. There's no place for political violence in America. We have to protect the right to vote, not suppress the fat fundamental right. Honor the results of our elections, not subvert the will of the people. We have to uphold the rule of law and restore trust in our institutions of democracy. And we must give hate and extremism in any form no safe harbor. Democracy must not be a partisan issue. It's an American issue. Every generation of Americans has faced a moment where they have been called to protect our democracy, defend it, stand up for it. And this is our moment. My fellow Americans, we meet tonight at an inflection point, one of those moments that only a few generations ever face, where the direction we now take is going to decide the course of this nation for decades to come. We're not bystanders of history. We're not powerless before the forces that confront us. 
It's within our power of we, the people. We're facing the test of our time. We have to be the nation we've always been at our best, optimistic, hopeful, forward-looking, a nation that embraces light over dark, hope over fear, unity over division, stability over chaos. We have to see each other not as enemies, but as fellow Americans. We're good people. The only nation in the world built on an idea, the only one. Other nations are defined by geography, ethnicity, but we're the only nation based on an idea that all of us, every one of us, is created equal in the image of God, a nation that stands as a beacon of the world, a nation in a new age of possibilities. So I've come to fulfill my constitutional obligation to report in the State of the Union, and here's my, my, my report. Because the soul of this nation is strong, because the backbone, the backbone of this nation is strong, because the people of this nation are strong, the State of the Union is strong. I'm not new to this place. I stand here tonight, having served as long as about any one of you have ever served here. <laughs> but I've never been more optimistic about our future, about the future of America. We just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America, and there's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Wow. He doesn't know this pile of horseshit, huh? <laughs> Franklin see, Roosevelt. So you're for fear instead of hope. And mm -hmm. You're for darkness. Instead yeah, of you know what? Screw light. <laughs> what you don't understand, <laughs> Ben, is that Franklin Roosevelt defeated Nazi Germany and Ronald Reagan defeated the Soviet Union and Joseph Robinette Biden defeated resort fees. <laughs> <laughs> what did he said tonight? Uh, I'm, is, I'm so amazing. moved. He, I'm he so was moved. very concerned about ticket fees at the airport, like significantly more concerned about that than China. Yeah. No, this, and it came much later in the speech than that. That was actually the part where he was just listing stuff he was annoyed by and saying he'll ban them. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly how I would handle a state of the <laughs> 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 most, most relatable he's ever been on. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That'll get him elected. Right? So I have, a, I have a few personal favorites. You know, we're going to play the hits a little bit here. So. Yeah, let's do it. One, one of my personal favorites was was the part where he said, you know, I approached all the <laughs> oil companies and I told them they need to start drilling. And they said to me, well, how we can build new refineries when you're trying to transition away from oil? And I say, well, we're going to we're going to need oil for at least about 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and people broke out laughing. People broke out laughing because um, you're making their case because you're a sad, screamy old. Yeah, because you couldn't build a you couldn't get the EPA approval to even start digging to build the refinery in 10 years. That, that's the actual truth. That's, yeah. that, uh, it is. You know, that was that was serious. I don't even have anything to say <laughs> on the specifics of that speech because I felt the entire thing was like standing in a bar where the guy next to you is drunk and won't leave you alone. Yeah. <laughs> He's just like <laughs> ranting yeah. in this Look it up! Uh, <laughs> Look it up! Oh. <laughs> this is like slurring Tremendously words. Tremendously gaslit throughout all of that. I mean, I... People have a lot of conspiracy theories about watching the COVID shots. You better hope it's a healthy bout of amnesia because he's pretending that he is going to be the person that is fighting against Big Pharma as if he wasn't the same person that we all just yeah. had to fight Tonight, at the State Daily the Wire because by OSHA tried to, <laughs> man, yeah, had to man, tried to mandate, Joe Biden tried to mandate via OSHA the vaccine to everybody's arm. It, it just it, it, They're applauding as if he's the person now that's fighting. I, I, I don't understand it. The insulin move with Big Pharma, he stopped Trump. Trump already did this, lowered the prices for insulin. He blocked it, and now he's reintroducing what Trump did. So I, I think people's and memories this, must be going. Comment, and we're this comment that we pay more for drugs than other countries is because they have single-payer health care. So the drug companies have no one to bargain with except the government. 
And when they come to us, they have to bargain with various different people. If they're not making profits off us, they're not making profits off anybody. If they're not making profits off anybody, 20 years from now, when cancer might be cured, when some cancer might be cured, it won't be. You won't even know what you missed. You will not even know what they took away from you. I I like the part where... um so, which one of you guys hit Paul Pelosi in the head with a hammer, guys? I think it was all of us. All of us. It was all of us. Was all us. It was all of us. Really, really, it was all of us. Who, who wasn't hitting Paul Pelosi in the head no. with a hammer while half naked and stoned out of her mind? <laughs> it, was, it was really because, you know, the big lie and, and January 6th and, mm-hmm. and Trump. So, that's why Paul Pelosi got hit in the head with a hammer and also unity. Mm-hmm. But, like, really, really <laughs> a lot of unity. And, and Joe Biden wants to be like, he's, he's standing up for all of us, especially the people who hit Paul Pelosi mm-hmm. in the head with a hammer. I thought that part was really <laughs> profound. And speaking, speaking of, of gaslighting, he brings Tyree Nichols' family on and then transitions immediately to a, to a discussion about racist police officers <laughs> when it was, of course, black police officers that killed him. And then also, can I also say that this whole thing about the talk, well, uh, white families never have to have the talk with the, their kids. But this is such nonsense. When I started driving, my dad explained to me that, son, if you ever get pulled over, yes, be respectful to the police officer. <laughs> if you don't agree with the ticket... Uh, fight it in court. Like, re- and by the way, ten and two. Ten and two on the wheels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doesn't doesn't literally every parent have that talk with yes. With, yes. with kids when they start driving? So this is and as someone who gets stopped quite often because I drive badly, <laughs> I drive too fast. I, I turn on my lights. I put on my my hands on the thing. You know, I say I say officer. It's almost the first word out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah. Because the minute they hear officer, they know that you respect them. And you're, That's I roll down the window and say, I'm white. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot stress this is a huge mistake. Cannot stress this enough, <laughs> officer. I'll start using officer. The officer is good. Yeah. How did, how did you like the random screaming? Uh, it's random right. screamy Joe is well, listen, one of the best. Screaming whisper is the when he goes really whisper, quickly. Whisper, whisper. Whisper. Ah! This is the this ah! was ah! this was an historic State of the Union, and I'm not actually joking. It was the first time that an octogenarian has ever mm. addressed the country as president of the United Congratulations States. Congratulations to us, man. This is a great yeah. country. Really, <laughs> literally anyone can be president. And, <laughs> and, 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 and it was an old man speech. Yeah. It was incoherent. It was rambling. It was shouting. It was all of his personal peaks. The, the no, real, the real giveaway too was because he's accomplished nothing and he's only failed. The whole speech was just about the stuff that he's definitely going to get to really soon. And it, and it, by the way, the stuff he's going to get to really soon was fixing the luggage fees, right? It wasn't even ambitious. I don't agree that he's failed. I, I think he's passed a lot of stuff. I mean, the inflation, whatever the hell they call the inflation reduction, the global you know, warming. The, bill. The, the fact that it's bad. It's different than the fact that But it hasn't fixed anything. He succeeded anything. in doing the thing he wanted to do. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I think right? the, but I just mean, he, bad. he can't come out and say, inflation is really great. He tried to a little bit, but it didn't work. Well, the, his stuff hasn't worked. Is yeah, not yet. Get, not yet. Now we're going to get the whole routine from the media about the Republicans were so mean to him, guys. They were so mean to him because they kept yelling at him during the speech. You can't yell at him. I thought that was great. I've never seen, has there ever been a State of the Union address where twice the president makes a claim and then walks it back in real time yeah, that was the, <laughs> yelled at him? He actually yeah. started, because we have the transcript of what the White House releases beforehand, right. and he literally had to elide full paragraphs of his speech because he said, the Republicans want to take care of Social Security and Medicare, and the Republicans are like, no, no, and he's like, no one wants to take your Social Security <laughs> yeah. and Medicare. Isn't that great? And they're like, yes, and, that, and then he just had to cut out like two paragraphs of his campaign stump speech. You're right. I mean, he, he walked that one back. I did like the part where he was shouting about how no one wants to switch places with Xi Jinping, <laughs> which um, I have uh, some news for him. Mm-hmm. There are a lot yeah, of all of them. Oh, yeah, Thomas yeah. Friedman. Like, was, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you know, we're, we're yeah. ignoring the real issue, though. And this was an issue that Matt pointed out to me at the very top of the speech. Can we talk about the weird kiss between Dr. Jill and Kamala's husband? The weird, like, makeout session? Oh, was that Kamala's husband? And it was weird. It was weird. I'm, I'm going to put a personal put, matter here. I'm <laughs> going to, what they yeah. do in the public forum is another person. What they do in the Capitol. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to push back on this and say that it was bad optics at a political speech. Yeah. And, it, and I will enjoy for the next 10 years of American public life. Uh, tweeting out the photo mm-hmm. with with funny quips. <laughs> yes, but if you actually watch the video of it, it is it's a slightly out of touch thing for them to do in a political environment. If they did the exact same thing at the Grammys or or at, at one of the Eyes Wide Shut parties. No, yeah. No, yeah. No, no, no. My, my point is that their own bedroom. That's no. yeah. <laughs> my, my point is that if we had seen them do that at. Uh, an Oscars after party, no oh, one would think anything. Oh, they're having yeah. an affair. Let's play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just want to make just a declarative statement. Down on the table. All right, all right. <laughs> also, everybody, uh, the, the media are already going nuts over over people yelling at Biden. 
Can, I, can you just get over Biden it? was yelling at us. That was the whole damn thing. <laughs> also, I'm, I'm super tired of this, this whole nonsense where a politician who gives a speech like this, no one can yell back at him. I remember they did this with Joe Wilson also. Remember the you lie moment? Yeah, yeah. It was like the biggest deal in the world. You lie. Okay, first of all, you guys claim that Donald Trump was a Russian plan for like four years. Yeah. For four years, and you spent tens of Still, millions, and you ripped up his speech. You're like, can we yeah. drop all of this garbage about how, you know, civility must dominate? No one can ever say to the president, you're wrong, when he's clearly lying about, you know. Have you ever seen British Parliament? Right, right. Yeah. Like, it, it's the best thing. We should do it like British Parliament. Like, the yeah. prime minister get up there, and we should mock him. We should all yell at him. It's, it's much better. It's much better. <laughs> yep. This yeah. is nonsense. Or our own Congress historically, when they're beating each other over the heads with uh, <laughs> <Canes>. <laughs> pokers from the, the fire. And all that Even when the king... Or now king, pre previously queen for all of our lifetimes, yeah. uh, opens the government in the UK and they summons the, the commoners, the House of Commons, over to the House of Lords for the, for the inaugural speech to open the government. They actually go through this kind of pantomime as they, as they cross through Westminster Palace of talking loudly and you know, kind of stomping over there as a way of saying we don't have to show respect to the king. So even in a true monarchy, right. they, when they have a truly monarchical speech by the monarch, uh, they don't have this idea, this faux dignity well, the, kind of concept the thing, that we but, have. But what Ben says is true, this question time where they beat the living daylights out of the prime minister is because they have this useless king that they can put their, they can project their country onto. They can then go after their politicians as what they are, which is a line sack. Did you see the biggest applause line of the night, by the way? This, this was actually truly sad. That they love abortion, right? The abortion one, when he said, well, I'm going to get up there. I devout Catholic Joe Biden. I'm going to get up. I am going to codify the killing of many more babies into federal law. And it was it was the most enthusiastic. Brought the house down. By the way, this, this is one of my favorite parts. Pelosi clapping, all the Catholics just. Mm -hmm. It's just it's. Yeah. One of my favorite parts of, the, of these speeches is where the president of the opposing party pledges to veto legislation that will never even come close to his desk. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the Republicans don't control the Senate; they ain't passing a, a national abortion ban. Right. Like yeah. it's, it's not going to happen. So I'll protect you from this thing that's never ever going to happen. <laughs> it, can can we talk about just his the the gap between who he is and the policies he's pushing are going to be a real dilemma for the Democrats. Because he is, in fact, as Drew says, a vehicle for all of their cherished hopes and dreams. He's spending more money than has ever been seen in the history of mankind. He's yep. pushing all of their most valuable and cherished goals, from transing of the children to yep. completely restructuring the American economy. He's doing all of those things. But also, he's an incoherent old fool who's yelling at the clouds. Yeah. And so that, that is a very odd combo. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons they are begging for Republicans to run a bad candidate in 2024. Yeah, They're of begging course. for it. Because no, anybody could tear this guy apart on stage who at least has a sentient bone in his body. Biden is trying to trans the kids. You know who else is trying to trans the kids? There are actually razor companies that are advocating that we trans <laughs> the kids. But there's one razor company that's not. You know what that razor company is? Tell us. That would be Jeremy's Razor. <laughs> oh, oh, ladies. Wow. Back. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Does he have a quaff as healthy and hydrated and magnificent as you see here? Of course not. And how could he when he's using chemical-laced products from so-called men's grooming companies that hate him and his masculinity? This Valentine's Day, get him a gift that says, I don't hate you. Get him a Jeremy's Razor's 30% off hair, body, or shave bundle. Unlike Mr. Clavin over there, I use Jeremy's tea tree and argon oil shampoo and conditioner, and the results speak for themselves. Hey, Stop it, AOC. I will not date you. Ladies, <laughs> your man isn't toxic. He just needs a shower. But order tonight to make sure it arrives by the 14th. Get your Valentine's bundle for 30% off. Just go to jeremysrazors.com. And there are people out there who think that I control you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, know. I wrote every I'm word of that. Why do we put all of our worst bits into the same <laughs> show? Yeah, it's like a greatest hits in, yeah. in real time. Yeah. Somebody on Twitter said Ben is a better Joe than Ben. <laughs> oh, than no. Joe. I thought that, that is fair. Oh, put yeah. the bag away. Oh, put, no. the, put the bag. Hey, oh, Joe, come back. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Joe's back. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Oh. Usually, right now I'm controlling him, but usually it's the media who are up his ass. Oh. oh, it's, oh. A sad, it's a sad story. I do think that... He cringes in shame. He crinkles in shame. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are literally uh, paid political commentators. Our only job in life is to watch the speech. And sitting here with you guys for the last almost 90 minutes, we didn't. We could not watch the speech. We were all sitting here. We have, I think they just came and took it before the cameras yeah. rolled. They had to print for us printed yeah. copies of it yeah. because it was so incomprehensible in real time. Yeah. He is, it, 
it is interesting to me how bad he is. And some people say, oh, there's no way he could run again. But I do believe it's a feature, not a bug. I believe his, his age, you know, we were talking as he entered the chamber that in some ways his sort of harmless uh, uh, aesthetic, but it's not just his harmless aesthetic. I think it actually is his sort of disconnectedness and his uh, mental slippage. All of that works to their advantage because it makes it makes him this sort of Trojan horse in whom they can plant all of their ideas. I mean, he really is more than more than any pre- you know. Everybody everybody used to say that uh, Dick Cheney really controlled George W. Bush, and my argument is always, listen, that's nonsense. The president is the president. In the president is vested the power of the presidency. But it had never occurred to me what happens when you have a president who is actually mentally incapable. But but this is his his strength, as you point out, Jeremy, is Joe Biden first entered national politics more than 50 years ago. That's right. And so it doesn't matter if he mumbles and slurs his words and screams and is totally divorced from reality. People are very comfortable with him. he, but do you put, feel bad for any person that poops their pants? In front That's of the, the truth. Pope. Old or young, you just go, oh, this person I, can't hold their bowels. And if they do it in front of the Pope, you, it's hard to be like, I really... <laughs> really hate this person uh, because he pooped uh, his uh, pants. And that's what you're trying to say, using a lot of nice words. Yes, what you're trying you. to say is feel really bad for any person <laughs> that poops their pants in front of the Pope. And that is true. I do, you are correct that he can run again. I don't think he will. It feels to me like the media is turning on him. I think it's purposeful. Suddenly they're willing to cover the Hutton Biden laptop. They're willing to talk about his corruption. They're yeah. willing to find the classified documents. They knew that they were there forever. They're not idiots. I, I and it also, seems to me like they're kind of gently kind of trying to back away from this. And I do think Tucker Carlson had done a segment on this a few weeks ago. Um, that they they may be priming Michelle Obama for a run, and and by the way, that's a serious run. Oh yeah, that's I, not. And I said on a show, that's not something to mock. I, Michelle Obama is not something to mock. No, Michelle I, Obama does not run for president and not become leave. president. I, I just well I, I have to push back. I have to push back on this idea though that, that that this is a superpower of his that he is incomprehensible and unthreatening. It's only a, it is a superpower if the Republicans don't run someone against him who is a statesman with a point of view. I, I think that, listen, I, think, I, I know. Yeah, like, that's all right. I just I, thought of I know, I'm sorry. It's unrelated. But, but, no, but, but I mean, I think, I, I think that like Trump was an amazing moment in history when things shifted as they had to shift. They were shifting already. They, they changed under cover of Trump so that the, the Republicans are now the party of the working class. They are now the party of the ordinary man, which they weren't before. And the Democrats are the party of the elite. And I think that if somebody stands up who is an actual statesman, I, I'm not going to say it's Governor DeSantis, but it's Governor DeSantis, who stands up and says, I, I can do the things that you need me to do in a statesmanlike way, like the president of the United States, I think he will wipe even Michelle Obama off the map. Mm. I do You're not think... True. What's that? You're a real optimist. I, I do not think that... I, I do not think another television personality, which is what Michelle Obama is, let's face it, is going to win against an actual person who stands for something but but that's very rare you know so I, I will say that there's there's something that that was interesting believe it or not in what biden was trying to do strategically with the speech and you can see it in how he backloaded all the controversial material so he actually back he knew everybody's going to tune out in the first yep. 20 minutes so he backloaded everything that had to do with the equity agenda that was all backloaded right the the policing stuff was all backloaded mm-hmm. uh, the stuff about trans the, the kids, kids mm-hmm. all backloaded uh, even some of the environmental stuff tended to be more backloaded he was focusing a lot on what he sees is the blue collar base. He's trying to wrest back away some of those Trump voters. And so he's focusing a lot on protectionist economic policy, on subsidies for various types of industry, for on unions, right? He thinks that he's going to run sort of the, the Tim Ryan, Ohio campaign, and that this is going to stand him in good stead. I don't think that his party is going to allow that to be the center of the, That's I don't right. think the media they, they, they wouldn't just cheering. ask Senator they Ryan. They were cheering when, yeah. he said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, when he said we need uh, fossil fuels for 10 more years. There was like dead silence from the Democrats. Right. So I think that I think he's going to have trouble squaring that circle. But you can see he's trying to make that move. He understands that in order for his coalition to be durable, he does need to expand it and win back a yeah. certain base that the Democrats have lost. I don't think the rest of his party understands that. It's a real problem. On the point of wedges, though, we were knocking him because it was a horrible speech. There is one really clever thing he did, though, and it was right at the top, which yeah. is he, mm-hmm. he got those two lines in about... Kevin McCarthy and about Mitch McConnell. Hmm. And there were lines to say, I, I'm actually looking forward to working with you, Kevin. I hope I don't hurt your career here by saying that. But I think, Kevin, I think you're great. And Mitch, you know, it's going to be great to work with you too, Mitch. And that's obviously a dig at MAGA, but it's really a dig at both those guys because uh, he knows. We can them in the eyes of MAGA. Of course, yeah. And that was after the, the most contentious house battle in what, 150 years, I think it was? 
Yeah, house, he, house leadership battle. That was smart. I did like the part, it wasn't his idea, but it was smart. I, 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 did, I did like the part where he's going to fight inflation by giving everybody $1,000 back on an electric car and building 500000 <laughs> that'll, that'll work. It, that'll pay top. for my Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> it won't, by the way. The Tesla was expensive. Yeah, it's yeah, a great yeah. car, but it was expensive. It is true. It is peculiar that all of the Democrat social policy now is aimed at helping well-off people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. From your, no, we're going to pay for your college. Uh, no, we're going to pay for your electric car. Yeah. No, we're going to pay for your housekeeper. No, we're going to pay for your even the COVID, uh, even the, uh, the the stuff about the non compete clause. They're going to want to get rid of non compete clauses. He pretends that this is about helping uh, fast food employees, which like apparently maybe there are a few that are on non compete clauses, which I can't imagine. But I never had the, one when I worked. The vast majority of that is not uh, yeah, it's not, tech not, sector. Right. It's it's high income resort fees. Yeah. No one who, <laughs> no, no one worrying about how they're going to pay for eggs at home today <laughs> is like, yeah, finally, resort, resort fees. This actually, yeah. this actually is a great point, is that he was talking about how, like, very specific ways he was going to reduce very specific bills, right? I'm going to, I'm going to mandate that there are no more resort fees. I'm going to make sure there are no baggage fees. I'm going to make sure that you can get a refund on your airline ticket. And meanwhile, the elephant in the room is that inflation, which he says is quote unquote down, is currently running at 6.5%, yeah. which is three and a half, to, which is, which is yep. more than Huge. three times, like 325 yeah percent what they're aiming at, right? Normally, you're aiming at a 2% inflation rate. It's running at 6.5%, and that's down, right? So he, he's avoiding that like the, like the plague and instead proclaiming that he's going to lower your costs in this way and that way and just hoping that you ignore the, the elephant in the room. There, there's so many sort of tacit lies that he was telling, his whole inflation reduction nonsense. Yep. Like, oh, Donald Trump blew out the, blew out the, the numbers on, on the deficit, and I'm bringing the deficit down. No, it's just that the programs under Trump sunsetted and so, therefore, less money was spent under those programs. Those were unanimously passed by the Republicans and the Democrats because of COVID. I, I love how he blamed COVID simultaneously for the crime increase as well as for inflation, right? right. And, then, and then he said, you know, COVID just kind of magically shut, COVID shut down our educational system. No, no, no you shut that. down our educational system. <laughs> yeah. He kept blaming extraneous factors for all of his problems. Well, of course, he gets the personal credit for By all By the way, teachers systems. are all going to get a raise, so there's that. He said they did that such an amazing job not teaching so during COVID. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They really didn't teach important. during COVID. They didn't want to go back to work. Also, we have students that are suffering, but people can't pass basic reading exams. Literacy exams are the lowest they've ever been in this country. But you know what we're going to do? Let's give teachers a raise. That will definitely help the problem. And a couple more years of school. Yeah. Couple couple of school oh, yeah, because right. we need, yeah, let's extend it to daycare. It shouldn't just be 12 years, they said. They need, they, we need more years. And that obviously is something that parents should be really paying attention to. That's, that's you, also something that he backloaded. Go on. That's, a, that's how you fix education system is by putting more money into it. Mm-hmm. But if you want to fix law enforcement, you take money out of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're perfectly sound one, argument. One, one thing that Matt said that I think is absolutely true is this is not going to be a political event at all. That that usually the State no. of the Union has a no. blip afterwards. It lasts like two days and it's going to go away. And this, I think, is yeah. going to be... It already is. But the only thing about this is that You know, it's interesting to us because we're political types and we like political stories. And it is a political story. It does tell us how the government is, how the strategy of the Democrats is playing out. But aside from that, it's not actually a political event. The the only thing about it that I think helps Biden is that there keep being kind of rumors of his demise. And they uh, they are greatly exaggerated inside of his own party. Not physically, he's dead. But but he's been dead for a while. They, <laughs> but metaphysically, they, they propped him on a horse like El Cid, and they're just riding him around. Yeah, but, it, yeah. but the the thing about what what keeps happening is that they proclaim that he was dead before the midterms, and then the Democrats slightly overperformed it. It's back. It's it's back. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on. Oh my. Oh. 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 You, you, didn't, you didn't break it. You did you what Biden didn't do in nine days. <laughs> wow. Amazing. We, we call him... Uh, America! <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. After eight days, the yeah, balloon finally, has been... Finally, finally. Yes, what a success. We took care of that thing right away. Oh, no. no. Tell us how you did it. Tell us no. how you did it, Mr. President. It was all me. <laughs> <laughs> I was here the whole time. I didn't see you anywhere it there, was, Mr. It President. It was part of my plan. I... <laughs> I, like I actually boy. only notice now that it's an ice cream cone in his hand. That's Harry that's Potter. a nice touch. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice little touch. Oh. <laughs> oh. Hi. Leave that, no, no, leave no, that no, poor no, woman no, alone. No, 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 Mr. President. Yeah. Not again. <laughs> oh. Oh. Is a country. If you want to spend even more time with us, you're welcome to come over to <laughs> Daily God Wire knows Plus. Why you would? <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine such thing. But we're going to do our members block here in a few minutes, and it's still there's still a little bit of time to get your questions in. Uh, we're going to be taking only questions from members at the members block. That's why we call it the members block. Become a member. DailyWirePlus.com/slash 
subscribe. You can get 40% off because it is our president is for sale sale. And uh, what do we mean by our president is for sale? Well, we literally mean <laughs> that China owns the president of the United States of America. It's a subtle, it's a subtle. Well, uh, now I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a rental. <laughs> this is the worst show ever. Can you promise me in the block that paper bag Joe Biden's Please not stop. going to be there? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I agree. Nothing's going to come of this. It was uh, it was over before before the speech was over. Like yeah. the political impact, you know, he he almost went out of his way not to dream big. I mean, you could say that the cancer thing is big, except that it was literally a plot line on uh, the West Wing <laughs> tw almost twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah. Whether or not to announce the cure that we could cure cancer at a State of the Union. You know what they concluded? You can't. No, you, you can't. can't actually say that. He's also been doing this shtick for like seven or eight years. Yeah, that's right. Cancer moonshot. Yeah. Just one more year, guys. He's, I think he's going to do it. Yeah. I think he's going to do it. I hate cancer. <laughs> Bold <laughs> statement. Yeah. Yeah. Name me someone <laughs> who doesn't want to be Xi Jinping. Name me. <laughs> <laughs> No, please take it all the way off. Yeah. <laughs> take, take, take. Throw it all the way off. It's a good run, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we go home? Yeah. No, <laughs> we have no. We can't go home, but we can go do our members' blocks. So right. Head over to DailyWirePlus.com <laughs> awesome. right now for the rest of you. Uh, we're going to catch back up with you on the other side. There are plenty more horrible political events coming this year, and we will be here to cover each and every one of them. We'll suffer them all. We will suffer them all together. Thanks for being with us.